and we'll start broadcasting to the public. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Urban, and I'm the chairperson of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. Welcome to our inaugural meeting. Before we get started, I have some logistical announcements. First, I'd like to ask everyone to please check that your microphone is muted when you are not speaking. Today's meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. Additionally, this meeting is being recorded. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by the board members. We have a designated time on the agenda for general public comment, and I will also ask for public comment on each agenda item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. If you wish to speak on an item, please use the raise your hand function, which is in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen near the right. Our moderator will request that you unmute yourself for comment. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. It is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is entirely voluntary, and you can input a pseudonym when you log into the meeting. I want to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and to keep your comments to three minutes or less. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board voting on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please use the raise your hand function so the moderator can recognize you. For those who join later in the meeting, the moderator will admit people between agenda items so as not to disrupt the meeting. We will take a break around noon or 1230 for lunch, depending on where we are in the agenda and shorter breaks as needed. I'm delighted to be with you this morning for the inaugural meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. The people of California decided to lead the nation in protecting consumer privacy when they extended the California Consumer Privacy Act by passing Proposition 24, the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020. A key part of this leadership was establishing the California Privacy Protection Agency, the first regulatory agency dedicated to privacy and data protection in the United States. We are eager to get started. Standing up an agency is a big job with a lot of complexities. I would like to thank the board members for serving. And I would especially like to thank the many staff at the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, the Office of the Attorney General, and other agencies who have been loaning their time to get us off the ground. The CPPA will be an independent agency but it must exist as an agency first. And I am grateful to BCSH and others for taking us under their wing. Behind the scenes, they have been doing everything from obtaining access to the state fiscal system, to setting up potential positions with human resources, to building a website so we could notice this meeting, to taking minutes today. They are led by Deputy Secretary Leila Mirashidi, Deputy Secretary Tiffany Garcia, and Deputy General Counsel Philip Laird. Finally, I would like to ask everyone for your patience in this first meeting, as this is the first time the board members have met. Our agenda is dominated by informational and logistical tasks, and this is the first time we work together. I would now like to call the meeting to order and ask our moderator, Mr. Evan Joseph Pinero, to please conduct the roll call. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, so board member, Lydia De La Torre. Present. Ms. De La Torre, present. Board member Vincent Lay. Present. Mr. Lay, present. Board member Angela Sierra. Present. Ms. Sierra, present. Uh, board member Chris Thompson. Present. Mr. Thompson, present. And chairperson Jennifer Urban. Present. Chairperson thank Urban, you. present. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. The board has established a quorum. I would like to let the board members know that we will be taking a roll call vote on any action items. Mr. Joseph Pinero, is there anyone in the waiting room? We do not currently have anyone in the waiting room. Thank okay. you. We will now proceed with agenda item number two, board member introductions. I will start. I am Jennifer Urban. I'm deeply honored to have been appointed by Governor Newsom as chairperson of the CPPA board. I'm a clinical professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. 
where I'm the Director of Policy Initiatives for the Samuelson Law, Technology, and Public Policy Clinic, and a faculty co-director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. My research and teaching focus on how information policy and emerging technologies interact with society. I work on privacy and security, intellectual property, and other information issues. I'm pleased to serve on the board. Ms. De La Torre. Hi, thank you. My name is Lydia De La Torre. I am um, really honored to have been appointed by Pro Term Atkins uh, for this position. I um, have an update. Um, I stepped down from my role at the Square Pattern Box, which is the role that I held when I was appointed to avoid conflicts of interest. I have my own small practice. I continue to teach at Santa Clara Law. I have been working in privacy and data protection for many, many years, since the 90s, basically. Um, I'm originally from Spain, so I'm a citizen of Spain. I'm also a citizen of the US. And I'm delighted to be part of the board and look forward to um, learning more about the other members and um, moving things forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Mr. Lay? Hi, I'm Vincent Lay, legal counsel for the Green Lining Institute. I'd also like to thank Speaker Andon for appointing me, and I'm honored to serve. Um, at, at the Green Lining Institute, I focus on closing the digital divide as well as our algorithmic bias and privacy work. Um, I have a long history of working at regulatory agencies and at administrative agencies, and um, I'm very excited to, to bring that expertise here to the, to the board. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. Sierra. Good morning. Thank you, Chairperson. And hello, everybody. Um, I, too, am very honored to be on this board. I was appointed by um, former Attorney General Javier Becerra. Um, I am a longtime um, attorney with the California Department of Justice. I retired from the California Department of Justice Attorney General's Office in September 2019. I worked there um, for about 33 years. Um, prior to my retirement, I was our chief of the public rights division. That's one of our three legal divisions. And in that role, I was overseeing 10 sections that included the consumer um, protection section, including its privacy unit, um, as well as um, our sections um, focused on the environment, as well as um, our civil rights enforcement section. Um, prior to my role as heading that division, I worked primarily in our civil rights enforcement section for about 15 years and headed that section as well, working on a wide variety of civil rights matters, including um, privacy matters there as well. Um, and then prior to that, just did a, um, a very diverse um, work in um, state and federal litigation and appellate work. Um, so I am very happy to be here and really excited to work with all of you. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Mr. Thompson. Good morning, uh, Madam Chairperson and colleagues. I'm, I'm excited to meet you all and, and get started on this work. Um, I'm Chris Thompson. Um, my current, my other job is I'm the Senior Vice President of Government Relations at LA28, which is the organizing committee for the Olympic Games, um, the entity that is um, planning and executing the Olympic Games in Los Angeles in 2028. Prior to that, I worked for seven years at Southern California at Edison in a variety of um, uh, leadership positions, um, the last of which was Vice President Local Public Affairs, so a lot of interaction with local governments and community stakeholder groups and others, um, and worked for about 16 or 17 years in the federal government, in the, the Senate and the House of Representatives. So I uh, had held senior staff positions in those bodies and worked on a variety of, of big pu public policy initiatives. Um, this is obviously a huge public policy issue and challenge ahead of us. Um, so I thank you for everything that uh, Chairperson Urban, the, the staff at BCSH and others for getting us this far. Um, and thanks to the people of California for enacting Prop 24 to, to establish this agency and Governor Newsom for, for appointing me. Um, so a big challenge ahead and, and I will endeavor to, to be transparent and accessible and, and responsive uh, as we move forward. So thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Thompson and members of the board. I'm excited and delighted to be working with each of you. Are there any comments from members of the public? There are no comments that I see at this time. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. Is there anybody in the waiting room? Uh, there is not. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. In that case, we will move on to agenda item number three, if Mr. Laird is ready. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Agenda item number three is our first informational presentation of the day on the Open Meeting Act. Um, our presenter is Philip Laird, Deputy General Counsel for the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. Uh, welcome, Mr. Laird, and thank you for this presentation. Well, thank you for having me. And again, congratulations to all of you on your appointment. Uh, exciting stuff. Um, so the next two presentations are mine and admittedly are a little bit the boilerplate of board meetings, but I'm going to try to make it exciting and interesting to the extent I'm able. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, though, because I am a visual learner. So it's always helpful for me to have a little bit of a visual component. Can you all see that all right? Perfect. OK, so to begin, this is an overview of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Uh, it's uh, important because it does apply to this board uh, as as with uh, almost all boards across the state. And so I uh, just want to give you sort of a general overview today of sort of what the act requires and um, sort of the rules we have to play by when conducting the board, the board's uh, business going forward. Um, so to begin, uh, the, the main policy behind the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act is this idea of transparency, of conducting the people's business and proceedings of public agencies openly and in a way where the um, public is both informed and has the opportunity to engage. And so as kind of a high level overview of, of um, some of the main um, major points in this law and major requirements, uh, first and foremost, as I mentioned, all board meetings must be open and public. Um, secondly, though, the board must provide notice and agenda to the public uh, 10 calendar days in advance of a regularly scheduled meeting. Um, this is important because this uh, accomplishes that, that aspect of adequate awareness so that uh, members of the public can make arrangements in advance so that they can attend these meetings and not be caught by surprise. Um, third is that the board must conduct its meetings and make its decisions in public. So again, uh, part of an open meeting is that the actual conversations and voting occurs all in this public space, uh, with some minor exceptions we'll get into in a little bit. Um, and then finally, the board must allow all persons to attend and participate in the meeting. So this being the kind of final tenant, right, that it's not just um, the board on display conducting its business, but also an opportunity uh, throughout a board meeting for the public to engage with the board and provide their thoughts and comments as well. So to begin, who is covered by the Open Meeting Act? Well, for your purposes, um, you are <laughs> board members of the Privacy Protection Agency. Um, uh, essentially, any state body con uh, consisting of two or more members uh, created by statute or required by law to conduct official meetings, such as yours, uh, is required to comply with the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit further about advisory bodies later, but it's just kind of a preview. Um, I'll just start by saying that advisory bodies, uh, if created by the legislature, or if created by this board, for instance, and uh, consisting of three or more members, would also be then subject to the Bagley Keene uh, Open Meeting Act, and then as well as a de delegated body. So the difference between these two, if you think about it, um, the advisory bodies being ones that really are truly acting in advisory capacity or maybe doing uh, uh, research or exploration of a certain topic, but only ever brings then advice or recommendations to the board and doesn't act on behalf of the board. Versus a delegated body is one in which uh, the, um, the, the subcommittee or, or, or the group uh, appointed by the board actually has been given the authority to take final action uh, in place of the board. So in those instances, um, those delegated bodies always have to comply with the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. But as I mentioned, advisory bodies, there's a minor exception I'm going to get to in a few minutes. Now, what constitutes a meeting? So a meeting is defined as any congregation of a majority of the members of the board at the same time and place to hear, discuss, or deliberate upon any item that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. 
Um, so in your instance, uh, this agency board is a relatively small board with just five members, and that means a majority being three members. Anytime three members are together or discussing an item uh, that's uh, subject matter jurisdiction of this board um, is considered a meeting. And so in those situations, those are, um, those are uh, instances where we would have to be complying with Bagley Keene and be conducting our business in an open meeting. Um, Anything shorter than that, uh, any smaller groups technically is not a majority and therefore does not have to comply with the Open Meetings Act. And there are a few other exceptions as well. Um, obviously, if you're together and not discussing agency board, maybe just purely happen to be at the same place at the same time, as long as you don't conduct um, actual board business uh, when you're with each other, um, that is all right, that can occur. Uh, but again, to be clear, anytime three or more of you are together going forward and you are gonna discuss something that this privacy protection agency is doing or, or thinking about doing or has jurisdiction over, that is a meeting. So going a little bit more into the weeds on that, there is um, sort of the cautionary area I, I wanna advise you all of. And that is um, there are what are considered serial meetings that can occur. And this is essentially where a meeting is held, even though maybe not necessarily three of you were in the same place at the same time talking about information. And so there's a few times this can occur. The examples here being uh, a linear communication. So I'm gonna go as an example, if for instance, the chair, uh, Ms. Urban were to talk to Chris about something, uh, 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 about uh, the agency's business. And then um, uh, Mr. Thompson then uh, called Ms. Sierra about uh, the same topic and also shared with Ms. Sierra what Ms. Urban had to say. This would create at this point, now three board members have effectively discussed a topic over time um, and have shared the opinions of each other board members with each other. And so the, the uh, the concern being that essentially a deliberation was held, even though it was over time, even though not everybody was together, a majority of board members have information that the public doesn't because they conducted these communications not in that public forum. Um, the other is this idea of a spoken hub communication. The little image here I think is perfect, uh, especially because it's got the right number of dots. Um, so the biggest thing is as you um, eventually hire an executive director and start working with that executive director consistently, um, you know, the risk is always that that individual will be at the middle of that um, hub and will be talking to all of you individually. And uh, while that is okay for them to talk to you individually, what they can't do is then sort of act as a go-between for you to converse with each other. So uh, the idea being, again, if each one of you called me uh, this evening about a topic today, and I then went back when I talked to each one of you and said, oh, well, when I talked to Mr. Thompson, he said this and Miss Sierra said this, Again, we'd essentially be deliberating in private. That's what the Bagley Keene Act prohibits. And so just um, cautioning and explaining that um, uh, in many ways, and, and I know you've already experienced this to a certain extent, uh, we, we do like to be very cautious in the state about when we engage with board members to make sure we're not accidentally setting up a situation where you might have a uh, Bagley Keene violation. So, um, uh, at the at the end, I'll, I'll of course be happy to take questions. But just to preview, this is something you know we, we always want to be careful about and, and make sure that we're not somehow gathering information from other board members in a way that um, kind of supersedes or circumvents the Bagley Keene Act. Um, so earlier, I, I talked about the idea of a subcommittee. Um, uh, boards are allowed to establish subcommittees, and um, uh, subcommittees, though, as I mentioned, can act in sort of two capacities, essentially, at least as the Bagley Keene Act uh, um, observes them. One is they can be purely an advisory capacity, and this is what we often see for a lot of boards, is um, uh, allowing uh, subcommittees to kind of do more detailed work, detailed research, um, uh, take initial public comment on an issue, consolidate that, and come up with a, a recommendation to then present at what would be a public meeting. Uh, a full board meeting, so to speak. Um, so the key to a advisory uh, a subcommittee is that if it's a two person subcommittee, um, they're not required to comply with the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Now, if it were a three person subcommittee um, in any situation, uh, that would still have to be then an open meeting, just like today's meeting is uh, where, you know, there's advanced notice and opportunity for the public to participate and comment. 
Um, funny enough, for your board, actually, a subcommittee of three people or more would actually be a full board meeting also. So um, again, kind of one of the, the funny uh, instances that come up with a five-person board meeting. But uh, this is just to say um, it is perfectly acceptable under the bagley Keene Open Meeting Act for a two-person subcommittee to be established by the board and to um, essentially um, meet, discuss, um, uh, research, uh, come up with recommendations they want to present to the full board without holding a public meeting. So I just want to really emphasize that point. Um, however, as I mentioned before, should a subcommittee ever be delegated actual authority to act on behalf of the board, where the board is saying, go ahead, you can go ahead and do this on our behalf and you don't need to come back and make a recommendation to us or check in with us. At that point, even for that two-person subcommittee, that needs to be an open meeting uh, to the public. So this next slide, I'm not going to spend too much time on because uh, while there are sort of uh, specific uh, rules in the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act about teleconference, video conference uh, opportunities and options, um, right now we're actually under um, the purview of an executive order issued by Governor Gavin Newsom last year um, that actually um, waives and modifies a few of these provisions currently. Um, but just so you know, if we were in normal times uh, and just uh, operating under the current Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, these would be the rules um, uh, that we would have to abide by. The main difference being um, that for each board member that was participating remotely, you would actually have to be participating at a place that was also open to the public. So um, the tricky part with this, right, is uh, if for some reason you can't make it to the physical destination, um, unfortunately, it's not okay to take them the meeting privately in your own home. Um, it, it needs to be in some sort of location where you are um, noticing that location on, on your agenda and then also making it available to the public to also participate in that location. Um, but that said, the, those are not actually the current rules we're operating under. So I'm going to go ahead and get to our next slide to give you a little bit more clarity on what we are operating under. So as I mentioned, uh, Executive Order N-2920 uh, issued um, last spring in 2020 um, did waive a number of these requirements and modify some of the requirements um, so that we could meet in a way that was uh, safe and continues to be safe, especially in the midst of a pandemic. Um, so first and foremost, the notice does not need to state where any of you are physically located. And as you noticed our, our agenda today, it did not mention where you're physically located, um, nor does the public have to be given the opportunity to um, uh, attend from your individual locations. So again, this is how we're able to meet in this capacity today. Um, furthermore, there ha doesn't have to be a physical location. Um, and again, for everybody's um, sort of safety and convenience, we are uh, operating entirely on Zoom today, for instance. And so that is uh, authorized under this executive order. And um, uh, again, since there's no physical location, there's no requirement, of course, that you be at any physical location either. So moving along, I, um, you've already seen at this point a, a notice for the board meeting we are attending today, which was issued, as you know, uh, 10 days in advance. Um, it does have to be sent to anybody from the public who requests of the agency a uh, notice of board meetings going forward. It also has to be sent to um, you, of course, the board members, and it has to be posted on the website. So again, these are things you, you might have noticed. We, we accomplished all of these. I promise we got it right. And uh, um, but this this is how we establish uh, proper notice for a meeting. Um, the notice will also include the name, phone number, of address of a person who can answer further questions about the meeting or agenda. And finally, uh, it has to include the web website address where the agenda and notice and other materials can be found for the meeting. Um, for the agendas, um, you know, you, you've seen today's agenda as a great model of what a standard agenda will look like, um, but in general, the Bagley Keene Act uh, does require that there be a general description of each agenda item. It recommends approximately 20 words or less is an adequate amount of detail for an agenda item uh, discussed or transacted um, to be discussed or transacted. Um, that provides adequate information to the public to know, hey, this is a meeting I want to attend. This is a subject I want to weigh in on or observe discussion on. Um, now, this also applies to open session and closed sessions. And so um, I'm going to touch on closed sessions in a minute, but um, an agenda both has to document those items to be discussed in open session and then delineate if there are items that will be discussed in closed session. Um, otherwise, the board is not permitted to uh, discuss or act on matters that were not properly noticed as part of the agenda. Again, this is to ensure that the public has adequate information 
and attends those meetings that they would like to uh, either be part of or observe. Um, however, as you also noticed in, in our agenda for today, there is an opportunity at the end to discuss um, items or issues to be included on the next agenda. And this is an opportunity where we would obviously encourage board members not to discuss substantively those items uh, that they are requesting to be on the next agenda. This is that opportunity to say, you know, we didn't talk about a certain topic today. I think it's important we talk about it at the next meeting. This is the proper time to bring that up and then it will be probably, properly agendized for the next meeting. Um, as I mentioned, cornerstone to, to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act is public access and participation. So all meetings have to be open to the public. All votes are open. It's not allowed to sort of take secret ballots and just report the final numbers. Um, you know, we, votes will be taken in a roll call format, especially right now when we're in a video, video conference setting. Um, meetings do have to be compliant with the Americans Disabilities Act. Um, the board may not impose conditions on public attendance at a meeting. So, um, uh, you know, one, one certain thing is if you were at a physical location, it could not be at a location, for instance, that charges an entry fee. This would be something that would potentially keep members of the public out. Uh, although reasonable security is allowed to be in place to, to, to filter uh, folks in should you be in a physical location in the future. Um, public must have the opportunity to speak either before or during consideration of each agenda item, and there can be no discrimination uh, against anybody participating um, uh, based on any of their protected uh, qualities. Um, and finally, uh, the public comment um, a section as well, as we mentioned, each agenda item should have the opportunity before action is taken on that item to allow the public to, to comment. Um, also must allow critical comments. Um, we can't uh, necessarily monitor for the type of comment. All, all comments are welcome. Um, but then uh, also important to note is that um, in order to run an efficient meeting, the board is permitted to establish reasonable time limit parameters, um, either per speaker. So for instance, a common um, uh, parameter on this is to limit public comment to three minutes per speaker on each agenda item. Also, if you know the board has a lot of uh, business conduct in a single day, they can limit the overall time of uh, allowed for public comment and then just provide an alternative means for the public to also additionally submit, for instance, written comment uh, uh, during the meeting as well. So this is important because um, while we value, of course, public comment and input, uh, it can't be at the expense of the board actually being able to conduct its business. So that's the purpose for, for some of these limitations. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, closed sessions. Um, there are um, specific times under the law that this board can convene in private uh, without uh, having that part of the session open to the public. Um, those uh, those um, situations are explicitly described in the statute. And so uh, when you are gonna meet in closed session on one of these items, uh, the agenda has to say what it is that you'll be meeting in closed session about and cite that specific statute that permits you to meet in closed session over that topic. And uh, at some point later on, then decisions actually made in closed session uh, must be then publicly announced. Um, finally, board members, um, just be sure that somebody in those um, closed session meetings is keeping minutes. Uh, those minutes do remain confidential, but they are required to be kept uh, um, in the course of a closed session. Um, so again, uh, today there is no closed session scheduled, so there will not be a meeting of that sort. Um, but a common one, for instance, will be personnel actions in the future. For instance, should you want to deliberate over who to hire for an executive director, for instance, that is a proper um, topic for your closed session uh, deliberations. And finally, my last slide on this topic is remedies for violation of Bagley Keene Act. Uh, first and foremost, a decision can be overturned. So if it wasn't done in proper compliance with this act, um, maybe a, an action voted to be taken, but where um, a lot of deficiencies uh, occurred um, and maybe the public wasn't able to participate in the way the bagley Keene Act intends them to be able to, um, a court could uh, turn that, overturn that decision. Uh, also for a court to overturn the decision, it means likely a lawsuit was initiated. So that's also something we're always looking at. Um, and uh, of course, if a decision is overturned, that means in large part, usually that uh, you have to restart the process at that point, reconvene, take another vote, it can delay actions of, of the board. And so again, always recommended we just do everything in our power to get it right the first time and not end up in these situations. And finally, uh, just a reminder that um, if there was ever shown a uh, intent to actually deceive the public in a deliberate um, 
violation of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, that is technically a criminal misdemeanor. So with that happy note, <laughs> that's the end of my Bagley Keene presentation. I am happy, uh, board members, if you have any questions you'd like to ask right now, uh, that is welcome. Um, otherwise, um, uh, that is sort of your general overview. Uh, I should mention too, you've been provided a uh, several informational overviews provide, prepared both by the Attorney General's Office and the Department of Consumer Affairs, who uh, oversees a lot of different boards who have to all comply with the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Hopefully those materials are useful to you um, should you uh, have any more specific questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Laird. And could you say just a little bit more about the materials? Um, my understanding is the um, handy guide from the Attorney General's Office um, is one set of information. And then the, the second guide from DCA is a little bit more updated. There were some changes to the law. That's correct. Um, the Attorney General's Office uh, um, uh, overview and, and, and handy guide uh, continues to be largely accurate, but there have been some um, case developments and a few statutory changes since then. Um, many of the major tenants still remain the same. You know, what's considered a meeting is still considered a meeting, but it's true that the uh, consumer affairs packet was um, updated and prepared uh, just a few years ago. So um, uh, is more accurate this time. Um, but that said, we're in this interesting time uh, where we've got this executive order we're, we're acting under. And um, I think there is also interest uh, in understanding now the benefits of these teleconference um, forums that I, I would not be surprised if you see a law change in the near future that maybe further allows for this type of format going forward. Thank you very much. All right, we will now move to comments and questions from board members. Ms. De La Torre. Oh, apologies. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you. So, um, Mrs. Lerr, you mentioned that um, when you were giving us a definition of what constitutes a meeting um, to hear something that relates to one of the items that's under the supervision of the board will constitute a meeting. Um, I, I was hoping that you could give us a little bit more um, color around what are the situations that we might want to inadvertently step into in, in that context? I imagine if we're just, you know, three of us attending an uh, event that is addressing any of the topics that there might be room making around and we just, you know, sitting and listening, um, that is probably not a violation, but should we have a conversation after the meeting? Can we perhaps be stepping into a situation that is more closely to um, a potential violation? Um, if you could give us some kind of tips around how to stay on the safe side of the law in those situations where maybe we're just participating in an event where we're listening to others, discussing things that uh, relate to um, the business of the board. Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I think you actually uh, painted a pretty great example of exactly uh, what, what I think in large part, at least the first part was absolutely appropriate behavior. And that is to say, it is absolutely fine for a majority of you all to be at a single location, for instance, at a conference on uh, privacy protection. Um, in fact, I would not be surprised if that will happen <laughs> regularly as this uh, continues to be an important topic that a lot of people will, will be engaged on. Um, but to your later point, uh, Ms. Delatory, it, you're exactly correct that the, um, the part where then the board name members need to be careful is to not, for instance, at the end of the conference, start discussing, uh, for instance, oh, that was an interesting topic. That's something we should start doing with our agency. You know, anything that starts to really um, touch on the business of this agency um, is something that's not proper for discussion for a majority of the members um, in these sort of events. But that said, um, maybe the distinction I can make is the is sort of the first word you used when I said, and, and maybe I misspoke to say, um, you know, hearing this information collectively, that is always going to be okay. It's, it's fine for you to sort of hear anything uh, in, in a common space together or hear the same information. It's when you begin deliberating on that information that we start to run into a Bagley Keen um, issue. So as tempting as it may be to, to want to kind of uh, talk with other members, especially when it's top of mind in this kind of environment or in this kind of event, um, 
the um, requirement really would be that you would hold off to discuss that until you were in that open forum, in this sort of open forum. Um, so um, this is all to say, fine for you to continue to engage in this uh, space, to attend conferences and, and, and anything like that. Um, but uh, just make sure that when you're in those settings that you're not discussing then any, any really substantive matters that connect to this agency um, uh, with the other board members until you're in this open forum. Uh, thank you. Will you, you mentioned su substantive, um, will you give us a little bit of um, clarity around what will not be substantive? Let, let's say, you know, speak about the time and the date of a meeting that we might be trying to arrange. Will that be outside of substantive? And is there other areas that are more administrative that might be outside of, um, you know, substantive? Uh, that's a great, uh, great question. And, and you're absolutely right. I think um, sort of minor procedural things like, you know, what date can can folks meet at? Um, these are things that um, often do get coordinated, for instance, by an executive director so that they can set a meeting at a time the, the majority of board members can, can meet. Um, but in large part, um, really it's anything that the agency, like the rule of thumb uh, uh, under Bagley Keene at least, is anything the agency could take at substantive action on. So um, for instance, you have rulemaking authority. Um, what I would you know, implore you not to do is speak outside of this meeting about, uh, unless you know, it's just with another member as part of a subcommittee, which we've discussed before, could actually be discussed privately, to discuss with the majority of the board members um, the, uh, 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 something that you think should be in the regulations or something that you think is missing from your regulations. Enforcement will be another part of this agency's business, right? And so thinking about um, industries that you're concerned are maybe running afoul of, of the laws or regulations in this space. Um, really, um, I mean, to be on the safe side, I would say generally just not talking, except again, in those situations of, of a properly designated subcommittee or something to that effect of really just not talking to the board members about sort of privacy protection. And to be frank, uh, again, absolutely fine. If you run into each other in public to ask, you know, how your uh, family's doing and uh, any fun trips you're taking, none of this will, will offend <laughs> uh, the Bagley Keene Open and Meeting Act. But it would, um, in, in terms of administrative, I mean, that's, I will say I would limit it honestly to sort of availability, for instance, to conduct an open meeting and, and things of that nature, um, because even items like um, hiring staff, these are things that um, hiring an executive director, this is something that the board is actually gonna have to act in a, in a public meeting to do at a, at a certain point in time. And so these would be an item um, where it's not necessarily proper or appropriate to discuss that outside of this context. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, perhaps too, as time goes on, you know, as specific examples, specific questions, we're always ha ha happy to advise. That was very helpful, thank you. When, Mr. Laird, maybe one example that has come up that I, I found helpful um, is the question of agenda items, which seems on the one hand logistical, but on the other hand relates to the business of the agency. Um, so maybe you could say a little bit about, about that. Yeah, well, that's a great example of why um, we have that as an agenda item today, to be able to discuss the next agenda items. Because to, to your part, uh, to your point, uh, Chair Urban, um, this does, um, an agenda item is essentially a, a establishing an opportunity for the board to discuss, potentially take action. This is um, setting into motion, essentially, the board's business. So even something as, what seems like innocuous as an agenda item is actually something that um, you know does help the board conduct its substantive business. And so, um, you know, discussing that outside of the open meetings is really not advised. That's why we've agendized it today so that we can have that conversation again in the public forum, so the public can observe our discussion of um, or your all discussion of what you think needs to be the business of this board going forward and what needs to be prioritized in, in the next meetings, for instance. So. Um, I, I, I suppose, um, you know, and I try to think of a, a little gut check tool, I, I would just say, you know, as you begin to discuss something, I think one question is ask yourself, is this something that could somehow come before me needing a vote, right? That would be my first question. And then secondly, um, it would be, is this something that the public would probably want to be privy to, uh, you know, is, is something that we're discussing that they might have an opinion on or want to provide a comment to. Um, 
those those help guide me when I kind of think through, you know, what 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 would be an appropriate topic for conversation or whatnot. But um, that said, um, it's as we go, I think, and as this board continues to meet more regularly, you'll get into the flow certainly of kind of what's what's proper for an open meeting and what's proper for um, another context. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from members of the board? All right, thank you. Is there any comment from those in the audience? Uh, Chairperson, it looks like we may have one comment. Uh, as a reminder, for anyone who'd like to comment, uh, please press the raise hand icon on your window. Uh, or if you're connected by telephone, uh, you may uh, press star nine uh, to indicate that you'd like to comment. Uh, so right now it looks like we have a comment from Garrett. Garrett, you have three minutes to make your comment. Yeah, uh, how do I join? Uh, Garrett, we can hear you. So um, I, I read earlier uh, that you allow discrimination on anything except race, national origin, et cetera. Can you, can you, uh, what, what, uh, what kind of discrimination do you like in your meetings? Please tell me. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Um, yes, we can hear you. Mr. Smith, thank you for the comments. I am afraid I don't quite understand the question. Uh, if you'd like to elaborate, uh, you do still have a <clears throat> couple minutes more. <clears throat> yeah, I got a few questions. Uh, one, Phil was talking about um, discrimination and uh, Phil said that uh, you can discriminate against anything except race, national origin, et cetera. Can you, uh, can you elaborate on, on that? Did you, did you not remember saying that? Or have you forgotten that, Phil? Um, I, I'll address any questions uh, from the board from this, but um, if, if there are questions, I, I suppose I can clarify, however, that um, those were examples of what uh, discrimination is not allowed, um, but discrimination is not allowed for any protected basis as recognized in California. Anything else, Mr. Smith? Why, why, are you, why are you interrupting me? Stop resisting. All right, Mr. Smith, thank you for your comment. Mr. Joseph, mm -hmm. Mr. Joseph Pinero, is there further public comment? I uh, do not see any other raised hands at this time. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Panera. Um, we will therefore move on to agenda item number four, um, continuing with Mr. Laird. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Our second informational presentation on the Administrative Procedures Act with which the board and the agency will be working. Uh, and I will once again turn it over to you, Mr. Laird. Great, thank you. And again, apologies, I know it's a lot of me talking at all of you right now. I will uh, try to keep this quick, but again, um, I think it's important, especially for this board, um, as over the next year, that uh, rulemaking is a large part of the responsibilities of this board um, to give you a overview at this point of what's entailed in the Administrative Procedures Act in order to uh, uh, create these regulations. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Bear with me for just a second. All right, so this is your overview of the rulemaking process under the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, so to begin, uh, rulemaking 101, uh, what is a regulation? Um, a regulation is essentially, um, has the effect essentially of law uh, that is created, however, by a, a um, body such as yourselves that was given the authority to do this uh, through the legislature um, uh, or in this instance, through the legislature and through Proposition 24, um, but essentially uh, creates new authority for, for a body such as yours to develop uh, rules that certain, um, uh, certain people or industries have to comply with. Uh, it's uh, funny for me because this board is one where um, the regulations actually uh, will cover a lot of uh, Californians, not necessarily a specific industry, but um, 
the idea is it's a rule of general application um, that uh, it is enforceable and required to be complied with uh, based on the authority of the board promulgating that rule. Um, what is the Administrative Procedures Act? That is the act that uh, all uh, state bodies, rulemaking bodies have to comply with when um, creating and implementing, amending or repealing regulations. And so I'll be going through sort of the requirements of that act in this presentation. Uh, what is the Office of Administrative Law? That is a office um, in the state government that actually is charged with uh, essentially processing and reviewing all proposed regulations in the state. And again, I'll go into more detail about their role in this process, but um, understanding that uh, any rules drafted and prepared and proposed by this board um, do have to go to uh, um, the Office of Administrative Law um, for review and final approval before they can file, be filed with the Secretary of State and go into effect. And finally, what is an underground regulation? Again, I, I won't belabor this too much, but an underground regulation is when a, uh, uh, an entity tries to enforce a requirement that it hasn't been actually put into regulation. And so the idea being, um, it's, it's a rule being enforced that really should have been a regulation. And these are situations we, we, we certainly try to avoid. And so I, I let you know that just to know that the importance of complying with this is so that we don't have a situation where we're attempting to enforce an underground regulation. So here is the rulemaking process in a nutshell um, to give you just a sense of, of timeline and sort of process, uh, try to simplify it as much as possible. So what begins is that an agency with rulemaking authority has a great idea or perhaps a statutory mandate, for instance, uh, as you're aware, uh, the uh, uh, Proposition 24 uh, requires uh, a number of rulemaking um, requirements for, for your board to execute um, within the next year, I believe, uh, with the deadline of next July 1, 2022. Um, so with that, that kind of kicks off the process for then um, you to consider what you want the regulations to be. And once you have a sense of at least how you think that you want to propose the regulations to be written, you would then come out with what is uh, considered a notice package that you submit to the Office of Administrative Law. Uh, they publish that in the state registrar on, that um, has all proposed rulemakings uh, published on a, I believe, weekly basis. And um, you would also publish it on their website as well as give notice to anybody that has requested notice um, uh, of regulatory actions going forward. Um, once that's published in the registrar, that cuts off, or kicks off what is um, a 45 day public comment period. And so you can make the public comment period longer than this, but you can't make it shorter. And so this is an opportunity for the public to submit written comments to the board um, over the course of 45 days about your proposed regulations. Now, when you come back, you've received all these public comments, you've sat with the proposed regulations for 45 days or more, um, there'll be the opportunity at that point for the board to either um, uh, adopt the regulations as initially proposed or to make modifications at that point. For instance, maybe a public comment po uh, pointed out a uh, discrepancy between two regulations you're proposing, or they suggested an idea that actually the majority of the board agrees is a really good alternative to what was initially proposed. In those situations, the board then can modify the regulation text. However, a modification then does require an additional comment period. That additional comment period is only 15 days, and you can do this as many times as you want. And I will tell you, I've seen uh, uh, rulemaking packages with seven or eight modified comment, modified uh, rulemaking comment periods uh, before, but um, otherwise you're also free to not modify, uh, to adopt the regulations as initially proposed. And at that point, you would submit that final rulemaking package to the Office of Administrative Law for approval. Um, the Office of Administrative Law then has 30 business days um, to review and approve the package or disapprove the package. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit more in a minute what they are looking for, um, but what I guess I want to impress upon you at this point is that the Office of Administrative Law will not um, reject a rulemaking package for the substance of the rulemaking package or for or second guess the reasoning of the board but they will uh, reject for not meeting certain objective standards within uh, the rulemaking process. 
If you're approved by Office of Administrative Law after that 30 business days, and again, with 30 business days, I just want to point out, you know, that ends up being closer to a month and a half when you consider weekends and holidays. So again, just pointing out between the public comment period at the beginning and OAL's review period, already we're looking at close to 90 days. Um, and in between, there's often a lot, of, uh, a lot of paperwork that has to be completed to create these complete files. So um, just trying to kind of prepare you that this can be a lengthy process. Um, uh, I know lots of entities in the state find that the rulemaking process often does take uh, close to a year to complete, um, even for sometimes more minor rulemaking changes. So what is the Office of Administrative Law reviewing for? Uh, first and foremost, they're reviewing to make sure you have the authority to promulgate the regulations you are, you're promulgating. So my example would be, um, although this uh, new agency does have pretty broad authority in the space of privacy protection, um, uh, for instance, something not in your authority is um, uh, how often zookeepers should take breaks uh, when, when working, right? This is something that's just completely outside the jurisdiction of what you, what you talk about. And so that would be something that would maybe go beyond the authority of your rulemaking, uh, of the authority granted to you by the legislature. Um, secondly, they're reviewing to see um, which statutes you are um, further defining or implementing. Um, these are considered the reference statutes, but the idea being it can be a court decision in some cases as well. But the idea being that in addition to you having the statutory authority to, to promulgate these regulations, you are also then carrying out some function of what was tasked to you as this agency. Um, so again, there I know for a fact within your uh, body of law, there's a handful of statutes that lay out sort of specifically what you should be regulating, and that would be your reference statute. Um, also, they're looking for consistency. And when I say consistency, it's both within your regulations as well as then um, with other laws and regulations in existence. So um, the idea being that your regulations should not directly conflict with, for instance, an existing law um, that would put these, these to attention and make it impossible for the public to comply with both, for instance. So they're looking for a consistent approach to kind of a legal framework. Um, they also are looking for clarity that the regulations um, are understandable and uh, provide adequate detail um, so that a person regulated by the regulation can understand how they should or should not um, act in a certain space. Um, there's a non-duplication standard, which is essentially, um, you don't need to just restate what's in the law and the regulations um, unless there's some reason why that's appropriate specifically in, in your regulations. Um, and then finally, the necessity standard. And this is one of the most important. It's um, something, it, that gets prepared uh, through one of the doc supporting documents, but it's that explanation of why it's necessary to write the regulations in the way you're writing them, why it's necessary to create the rules you're creating to address a certain problem or task set before you. Um, I've put in bold both the clarity and necessity standards because I just wanna mention that uh, these are often the hardest parts um, for the rulemaking process and it's uh, uh, what the Office of Administrative Law often observes uh, issues with, and when they reject files, it's oftentimes because of a lack of clarity or a lack of necessity. Um, so again, we can, we'll go into that a little bit more as my presentation continues. So the main parts, just for your awareness of what's in that initial notice package that's gonna get filed with the Office of Administrative Law, there are a few other documents in this, but I just wanted to give you a, a high level, at least of like the main um, components of, of that initial notice package is going to be your text of your regulation. So uh, it can't just be the idea of what you think the regulation will do at some point. It's actually gonna be the written language that you think the regulation might say at the end of this rulemaking process um, or what you're proposing the rule to look like. If it does incorporate any forms that have to be used, those have to be uh, provided with that text at that point. Um, and otherwise, I think, I think that's all I'll need to say for text for now. Then there's also a document called a notice document. Um, there's essentially a number of things, um, which I might even call a little bit boilerplate, but that are required to appear in the notice. I think I actually go into detail uh, on that in a minute, I'm realizing. Um, so I'll just kind of stick with my overview here. Uh, there's then a document called the initial statement of reasons, which I consider kind of the meatiest document uh, oftentimes, because it's a really the lengthy explanation then of why your text says what it says. 
Um, then there's this form 399. This is a standard form that's part of all rulemaking packages and it's your economic impact assessment that you do on from your regulations. Um, and then also what I mentioned, in addition, in certain situations, um, if a regulation is considered a major regulation, you also then have to include what's called a standardized regulatory impact analysis. The um, uh, SRIA is what you'll often hear it called, a SRIA. And um, this is required anytime the impact of the regulations is $50 million, is estimated to be $50 million or more in a 12 month period following their, their adoption. So again, to just give you a little bit more detail of what each component looks like, um, the regulation text will be shown with underlines and strikeouts, um, uh, just much like uh, for those familiar with legislation, right? There's often um, a use of underlines and strikeouts to show new language, language being repealed. Um, also, every regulation does have to cite at the end uh, the authority and reference statutes it's relying on. And then, as I mentioned before, one of the biggest, uh, the most important components of, of when writing your regulation text is that it's readable, or uh, more specifically, that it's written or displayed so that the meaning is easily understood by those persons directly affected. So that's sort of the standard that uh, the Office of Administrative Law monitors, you know, is this uh, easily understood? By those being regulated now by this new by this new uh, rule, um, and then finally, just minor that it should be easily identifiable subsections. Again, regulations often look very much like laws, how they're written and how they're broken down. And certainly, I encourage you to kind of look to that model when developing your own regulations. Um, hard to know if you'll be incorporating many forms by reference, but if you were um, in the text, you would also have to make proper reference to, to that form by title and date that it was adopted. So moving forward then in your notice, um, included in the notice is uh, just that, a notice that the agency board is considering a new rulemaking. Um, it's essentially a, 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 a notification to go out to the public saying, hey, we're, we're considering doing a new regulation in this space. Uh, informs the public how they can submit comments and, and request a hearing if a hearing has not already been scheduled on the proposed regulations. Um, it includes general overview of relevant existing laws and regulations, policy objectives, and a general description of the proposed regulatory changes. Um, finally, it will give a summary of that economic impact assessment that you did in more detail in your Form 399 or your SRIA. Um, again, just giving folks the high level sort of concept, both of what you're trying to regulate and what you think the impact is gonna be economically. Then there's that document I mentioned called the Initial Statement of Reasons. And as I mentioned, this is a very important document because it, um, uh, and often the, the lengthiest document in the whole package, and it provides a detail about the purpose and necessity of the regulatory changes. Um, so one of the first things you'll see in the document is what's considered called a problem statement. And it's where um, you will essentially state what the problem being addressed is. Now the problem can be uh, a problem you're actually identifying that we're trying to fix and solve by regulation, but your problem can also be that the lead, you know, oh, this law actually tells us we have to promulgate regulations on this topic by a certain date. And that would also be the problem being addressed, right? Is that you've been given this task to accomplish by a certain deadline and therefore you have to conduct this rulemaking to comply with the law essentially. Um, but then the, the real kind of uh, meat of the, this document then would be the section that explains the necessity of each component of the regulations. And so when I say each component of the regulations, I guess I just wanna be clear that um, usually I recommend that for every subdivision in a regulation, there's at least one sentence explaining why that subdivision was necessary. And the idea is, um, you know, nothing in these regulations should be arbitrary and everything should be understood as to why um, this board chose to um, maybe tackle the problem in the way they did, chose to write a requirement in the way they did. So, um, for example, um, you know, it an example I often use is say you were regulating continuing education for a particular industry. Um, if you were to say um, every, let's say doctors, say every doctor has to complete four hours of continuing education in ethics every two years. Well, I'd have a number of questions, right? Why every two years? Um, why does it have to be in ethics? Why four hours? Why not eight hours? Why not two hours? These are things that you would explain in this document to say, you know, the board made the determination that it was necessary to require four hours of ethics because. And so I will just say, um, to me, the best initial statement of reasons um, pack, uh, documents always have that kind of structure to them. 
where they say, the board is doing this, the board found it necessary because, and that will often help set up the, the opportunity to, to provide an adequate explanation. And then finally, um, it includes, as I mentioned before, the in economic impact assessment or the, um, or the SRIA, the standard regulatory impact analysis. Um, as I mentioned, that Form 399, this is a standard form that's been provided by the Department of Finance. This is part of every rulemaking package. And essentially what it does is it provides estimates for economic and fiscal impacts of the regulatory action. Now, one thing I wanna be clear about, it's limited to the actual regulations you're proposing. It doesn't have to reflect, for instance, the law that requires you to do something. Um, so again, not sure how much you'll come across this with your board, but just uh, understanding that um, it's only in those times where the where your board is exercising discretion and deciding how you want to write a regulation that you are creating the economic impact. If it's a law that requires, for instance, a $50 annual fee, and that's what the law says, well, your regulation that says a $50 fee is required isn't creating a uh, um, an economic impact. It's that law that uh, behind you that made that economic impact. So again, a little bit of a difference, a little bit of a nuance there. It's important considering when you write these regulations, um, you know, reflecting on what does the law require and what are you choosing to do in your regulations. Um, and then finally, uh, if there is going to be a fiscal impact, so an impact on um, your agency, for instance, uh, operations or another state entity's um, uh, budget, for instance, more money is going to come in as a result of this, or we're going to have to spend more money to uh, enforce and execute these regulations, um, that requires a concurring signature from the Department of Finance as well. So as I mentioned, there's this thing called a SRIA, and usually I don't actually include these in my presentations because it's actually not that often that a regulation will have an economic impact of more than $50 million um, in a given year. However, um, with your entity, given the impacts uh, given the breadth of your jurisdiction and the breadth of, of uh, businesses that uh, your regulations will touch, um, it's almost certain that there will be a $50 million plus impact from your regulations, um, just given all the different um, subject matter they are uh, required to cover. Um, so in doing so, it's a special, um, special analysis that has to be prepared. Um, uh, typically, finance asks every February 1st to be made aware of any um, SRIAs you expect to, to uh, submit to them in the given year. Um, at this point, we have not done so, but if you don't, they set up an alternative process where as long as you can give 60 days notice, um, that helps them prepare to be ready for your, um, uh, your SRIA and to engage then when it comes in, uh, in sort of considering the assumptions made. Um, you also must solicit public solicit, sorry, public comment um, on the proposals and alternatives. So again, this is gonna be sort of in your early rulemaking exercises is when you'll be starting to engage in also this question of the economic impact and alternatives of the proposals you're coming up with. Um, and it will essentially, this SRIA will analyze then the economic impact and also consider, for instance, um, other alternatives um, with different cost, uh, cost benefits uh, attached to it that, that would maybe reasonably accomplish the same things. Um, the truth of the matter is most three as I've seen done in the state are done um, uh, with the assistance of an economist. And so if there is an economist on staff, oftentimes it's helpful to contract with an economist. Um, and I will say, for instance, the Department of Justice, when, prominent, when creating their regulations initially in this space, um, did have to prepare a SRIA, uh, did contract with an economist to help prepare that document to make sure it really um, gave a thorough consideration of economic impacts. Um, again, this is something too, I should mention the Department of Finance has regulations about specifically how it should be prepared. So, uh, and they have folks there that can kind of help through the process as well. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna jump you forward. We've had our public comment. Maybe we've modified the text a few times or, or not. And we have a final rulemaking that the board is ready to move forward with. Um, what happens after that board votes to approve um, the rulemaking, they will submit, uh, these are really just the high level documents. There's more that would be included in the package, but these are the important things. It would be the final text that you voted on. So it would be the text, um, you know, if there was modifications made, it's the final text that we gave notice that we were considering for adoption. Um, there's also a document called the final statement of reasons. The final statement of reasons um, 
uh, is just what it sounds like, right? It's the follow-up document to that initial statement of reasons, providing any updates to sort of any of the thinking or um, necessity um, initially considered for the regulations. And then it's also everything else that was in the initial package and a little bit more. They're a pretty meaty package by the time they get to the Office of Administrative Law for this. But um, briefly, I just want to touch on that final statement of reasons document. It's going to provide a number of things, uh, any updates, for instance, in this space, because as I mentioned, you know, your rulemaking process might have started in 2021, but by 2022, maybe the legislature has passed a new law, or maybe uh, you've actually on the side created other regulations that now impact sort of how these regulations will work. Um, you will also, as I mentioned, update, for instance, if you had made changes to the text and you need to further explain why they were necessary to make those changes, you would explain that in this document. And finally, most importantly, this is the document in which you respond, you respond to public comments to. And so again, as I mentioned, there's that 45 day period where you can receive public comments. There's further potential 15 day comment periods where you might receive written comments. And then if a member of the public requests a hearing or if on your own choice, you want to hold a hearing, then any oral comments uh, or written comments presented at that hearing would also have to be considered by the board and addressed in this final document. Oftentimes it starts with the phrase, the board accepts or the board rejects. And so um, again, just giving you the sense of um, the type of response we're looking for is one that engages with the substance of the comment and explains why the board is either declining to uh, make the change suggested for instance, or uh, anything of that, that nature, or, or is declining to take further action on a certain topic being raised or is accepting it and demonstrating how, as a matter of fact, for instance, by modifying the text at one of our more recent comment periods, we addressed your issue. Thank you for your comment. Um, a few things though, uh, I'll just mention, it is okay to summarize and combine comments. And I believe Department of Justice had to do that for their package. So, um, you know, to the extent you get the exact same comment a hundred times, it's okay to then just say, this is the general comment we received was about this topic and making this recommendation. This is how we respond to that comment. And it's okay to then just have that one response. Um, and then you're also allowed to summarize comments. You don't have to reproduce them uh, word for word. Although the actual comment received will be part of the official rulemaking package. And so as I mentioned, then the Office of Administrative Law are the last kind of stop when you submit that final rulemaking package. Um, before they ever publish the notice, they will do a, often a courtesy pre-review, but they're not actually looking for a lot of substance. They're really just making sure that you've kind of made hit all the major points that are required into the package. So I guess I just wanna let you know that uh, even though you get something successfully noticed does not mean that it's complied with all of those Administrative Procedures Act requirements by the end of the, um, by the end of the uh, uh, rulemaking process. Um, but then at the end, they have, as I mentioned, 30 business days to review that final rulemaking file. And as I also mentioned, what I most often see is files getting rejected for clarity and necessity. So that's where we wanna make sure we've paid, paid extra attention to those, um, those requirements in the APA. And then um, at that point, they will make a final decision. They will either say, yes, you, may, you met all six uh, requirements of the APA, we are approving this file and it's going to go into effect in a certain amount of time. Or they will say, we think you missed the mark on certain things and we're going to reject this file. And what often happens is you will get a pre-notice that they're going to reject your file and you have the option at that point to either withdraw, which essentially means you're they are not going to reject the file. You've withdrawn before they could do that. Or you could accept that rejection, that denial. And if you do that, that kicks off immediately a 120 day clock to then address any of the issues they identified in their rejection and to resubmit. So um, again, that's maybe more in the weeds and we need to be on that final part of the process, but just to give you an idea that there are sort of multiple ways to approach that situation and there's reasons to go with um, either depending on what you're looking at. Oftentimes, for instance, um, if you're running up on your year clock, which I forgot to mention, so from the time you notice your rulemaking package until um, your final submission to OAL, um, you have to conduct all your public comment and all your rulemaking and get that done in a year. If it's gonna take more than a year, you have to then restart your 45 day public comment period. So there's real impetus from the time you go from that 45 day clock starting the first time to getting this done a year later, getting it submitted to the Office of Administrative Law. However, if you turned it in on day 364, an Office of Administrative Law says, hey, we think there's some problems, we're gonna, re we're gonna deny this file. That's when that 120 day clock, for instance, would come to your advantage because then you'd get that 120 day extension to, to um, uh, 
fix and uh, finally adopt your regulations. Um, and so finally, just uh, noting, um, regulations are typically then go into effect on a quarterly basis. However, you can ask that they go into effect upon filing with the Secretary of State as necessary. So for instance, um, you all are looking right now at a statutory deadline of July 1st, 2022. If you get this submitted to OAL just in the nick of time, uh, we obviously wouldn't wanna wait till the next quarter, October 1st, for them to go into effect. We would say the law requires these to be in place by July 1st. We respectfully ask that they be put in place July 1st. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. I know I hit you with a ton of information. Um, this is something obviously that's available to you and um, uh, ongoing. And uh, of course, we'll be happy to assist. And as you get staff uh, that are knowledgeable in, uh, in this space, uh, they will of course be able to assist with this process. But um, uh, for the time being, happy to take questions at this point. Thank you very much, Mr. Laird. Uh, so we have Ms. De La Torre, then Ms. Sierra, then Mr. Lay, and then Mr. Thompson. Ms. De La Torre, would you kick us off, please? Thank you. Um, a, a couple of questions. Um, the first one, um, you, you mentioned that I don't have a lot of clarity on the, the fact that there's existing rules, the CCPA rules, and now we're issuing new rules. Um, so how that's the fact that there are rules in place impact our process? I mean, can we adopt part of those rules, which will perhaps result in less administrative burden in terms of getting those to final? Or are we basically starting from zero where we have to re redo the process basically that the AG um, undertook, even if it's to arrive to the same rules in some, at, at least in some of the parts that's an excellent question, and I have good news for you on that front. Um, the way uh, Proposition 24 was written and the Privacy Rights Act is written, um, and as you will see a little later on the agenda, is this idea that um, this board, uh, when it's ready, is going to be assuming rulemaking authority for these regulations. Um, but it leaves in place the regulations already adopted by the Attorney General's office and actually gives you then the authority at that point to... Um, add to, amend, or repeal anything they've previously written. So I guess for, uh, to answer your question, you know, specifically, those re regulations will remain in place unless you choose to amend or repeal them. Um, if you do either of those, then you'd have to explain and justify why you're amending, but you don't have to explain why they were adopted in the first place. That's already been adequately justified and has gone through the APA process. So. Um, Really, all you, all you would be doing is, uh, is amending or repealing at this point. That's very helpful. The um, second question that I had, um, you didn't touch on your presentation on pre-rulemaking activities. Um, that's something that the AG undertook when they issued the rules, and I think that that's something for us to consider, just um, in regards at least to the new aspects of the law that were not covered by CCPA. Um, could you address a little bit the idea of pre-rulemaking activities and maybe gathering comments? How will that work and whether that is something that is typically done by other agencies before engaging in a new rulemaking? Absolutely. So first, yes, this is done by a lot of uh, rulemaking entities in the state and is highly encouraged, in fact, even in the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, uh, as you as you saw, right, this is a pretty thorough process um, and uh, requires kind of a lot of check-ins with the public and a lot of times for public feedback. But we find that it makes the formal process much smoother the more public engagement there is beforehand. So um, what I want to say is that um, while what I've described is the official process you have to do on the back end, there is nothing um, required or prohibited for how you want to do the process it beforehand. So for any sort of pre-engagement you want to do, um, you can do it in whatever format you want. There aren't rules at that point of how long public comment periods would need to be open or how you even want to solicit public comments. Um, you can really do it in whatever format you want, and I encourage you to be creative and thoughtful about that because I think it's a great opportunity to learn what the public expects and what you think will be the most effective way to carry out the execute the regulations. And oftentimes um, it then makes the formal process that much more smoother because you already have you know, a critical mass of folks that have had the opportunity to engage, have discussed with you and understand the direction you're going and maybe 
um, uh, less inclined, for for instance, to object to certain things uh, being proposed uh, because it, their their thoughts were taken into consideration already in that early stages. So any sort of pre-engagement is encouraged and you can do it in any way you want. It's only once you want to start that official notice and start that official 45 day public comment period for this, for the rulemaking under the APA uh, that you would have to start then following the, the formal process. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. I would like to insert myself here briefly just to follow up on Ms. Delatore's good question to, to ask Mr. Laird about how the sort of information gathering, request for information kind of um, procedures we might follow interact with the timeline of when we can take authority um, to do rulemaking. So there will be a six month clock, which we'll talk about later in the meeting. But I'm wondering if we can engage in some of these preliminary information gathering activities prior to that clock running out. Sorry, uh, absolutely. The short answer is absolutely you can. Um, in terms of the authority to start this process, um, there, there's nothing, and, and this happens a lot uh, as, as sort of um, new authorities are created by the legislature for other entities, for instance, where they will then start the rulemaking process for something where maybe the authority doesn't kick in until a certain date. And so um, to the chair's point, um, you will only need to have the um, official legal authority to promulgate the regulations when you're submitting them for final adoption by the Office of Admin Administrative Law. All your activities prior to that, um, you can begin right away. Wonderful, thank you. Ms. Sierra. Great, sorry about that. Um, Phil, thank you so much for these presentations. This is really helpful. Um, I had a follow-up um, question with respect to, you know, once we as a board and working with staff are developing language and there'll be, you know, I assume, you know, it'll be evolving language as we're um, making edits. So this question has maybe a little more to do with Bagley Keene as a board if we um, want to submit edits on language, um, what are our options? I mean, can we you know, each be submitting ed um, edits to the chairperson or to a subcommittee um, or how do we go about that in this type of setting? Uh, great question and appreciate it. <laughs> appreciate it. Always appreciate people asking about the Bagley Keen things before uh, you know, <laughs> the events occurred. Um, no, so, uh, Essentially, I think there's a, a one format that I see common for boards to get around this issue you're talking about is that they will um, establish subcommittees, right? And a subcommittee is an opportunity for, you know, a um, few board members to sort of really dive deep on a certain topic and then come up with a proposal and then at a public meeting uh, would present this to the board. And, you know, as, as you saw, uh, we made the materials for the board meeting available in advance of the board meeting on the website for the public as well. Um, typically, that's when the advisory committee would also post, for instance, uh, the recommendations they've come, in, come up with. And then that would be the opportunity for the rest of the board to consider, to read it over, and then in this public forum discuss, is this the right way to say this? I'd like to recommend we strike this line. So um, a lot of that discussion does happen um, uh, in this open session, and that's the appropriate place to, to have those discussions. Um, but the benefit of a subcommittee is they can really do a lot of that just initial, you know, where do we start with A1, right? Yeah. What's the first thing we need to say? Or how do we want to outline this? You know, things that would maybe, if you had to discuss during this whole open meeting with the entire board might take hours and hours, if not days. Um, that's a way to more efficiently do your time. Uh, and so um, one example I've given to the chair uh, previously is, uh, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, um, they, their Fair Employment and Housing Council uh, does rulemaking exactly that way. They use two-person subcommittees who really dive deep on specific regulations, come up with recommendations, and then those are discussed and considered and ultimately adopted by the full board in a public meeting. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, to follow up on that one as well, Mr. Laird, could you say a little bit about how staff of, an, of the agency would interact with the process that Ms. Sierra was asking about? 
Uh, that's a great question and hard, you know, for an agency that's maybe a little understaffed at the moment, but is working to change that. Um, uh, typically, though, I'll, I'll be honest, what I what I see um, in boards that are fully established with the full staff um, is uh, oftentimes there's direction from the board saying, hey, staff, this is the idea. This is what we want to require. Can you go figure it out some language for us? And then staff would be the ones to actually prepare that language, prepare the rest of the package I told you about, and then bring it back to the board for that same consideration we discussed. That's another way to go about um, drafting these regulations and um, in a way that's kind of efficient use of everyone's time and allows um, maybe staff who's, who's really spending day to day in the weeds on some of this stuff to kind of be thoughtful and come up with a process that then you can engage more objectively almost to really make sure that it, that it uh, sort of makes sense once put to practice. So um, it's definitely fine to utilize staff to prepare some of this initial information. Again, though, for this full board to then consider that language and eventually adopt that language, that would all be done in this public open meeting. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Mr. Lay. Uh, thanks, Phil. Um, I also had a question around the time frame. You mentioned there's um, about one year to get this legislation out. So, you know, what are we looking at if we're trying to hit that July 2022 um, deadline? Uh, that's a great question, too. And I will say that's a tough timeline, but um, uh, not totally undoable <laughs> um, is the good news. But it does mean um, uh, a, a lot needs to happen in the next year. Um, Essentially, you can always do it. Fa the faster you can do it, the better. Great. But as I mentioned, there's a few hard timelines in the APA that you can't really get around, even if you're able to turn around the documentation immediately. So um, as I mentioned before, I envision you'll probably engage in sort of, uh, um, and as Ms. De La Torre uh, mentioned, sort of pre-engagement on some of these subjects might be a way to go about this. And then at some point, um, uh, you, you or staff will come up with draft language, actually, and then that will kick off the 45-day public comment period. Um, and then uh, at a board meeting, you'll have to decide, do we like the draft still as, as originally prepared, or do we actually think we have second thoughts now, or the public pointed out some good things. And as I mentioned, every time you meet um, to do that and uh, consider whether to adopt or further modify the regulations, you know, that's going to have to be an open meeting where you're going to have to give 10 days notice in advance. And then um, and then uh, uh, for each modification, you know, you'd have to wait then for the additional public comment period. Um, and then finally, there's that final submission to the Office of Administrative Law. So doing rough math, working back, I think the goal would be for you to have your final package submitted by um, the middle of May of next year to make sure they could go into effect by July 1st. Um, as I mentioned, though, there's a lot of writing that goes with these things, and, and you have, I think, a pretty big set of regulations, and it's not just the text, it's that justification as well. So um, giving yourself ample time to kind of write the details of this into the package is really important. So, um, you know, thinking about your, your mid-May deadline, I mean, I, really, I think the sooner you start on public engagement, the better, and then the sooner you start getting draft language out uh, for public consideration, the better. Um, so uh, this is all to say, I think it's absolutely doable, but it is going to be a, a, uh, a tough timeline. <laughs> oh, thanks. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Chairperson Urban, and thanks, Bill, for this the presentation. Um, some of uh, the other board members have touched on questions that I had. Um, you know, there. Clearly, we're going to need to have a conversation about timing and resourcing to to get all of this work done. Um, you know, I took your admonition of a year to mean effectively you need to be starting now to be in effect July first. Um, I have a couple of minor questions on your presentation. One is um, the notice package, uh, the 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 OAL review. Do they do a review for authorities and other things at the notice package stage or only at the final rulemaking stage? And can you say, I mean, these are gonna be, the scope and breadth of these regulations is gonna be substantial. Is there expertise there? Do we need to allow more time than has historically been the case? 
Uh, excellent, excellent questions. Um, so first and foremost, they do their thorough legal review for Administrative Procedures Act compliance only at the final submission in that 30 business day review period. When you submit a notice package, they often will do what's considered a courtesy review, where to the extent they have time, they're just making sure all of the components are there, essentially. They're not really diving into the substance very much to make sure your package is clear and has adequate necessity. At that point, they're just saying, okay, you have a notice, you have an initial statement of reasons. It has these components. This looks good to go. We don't see any deficiencies on the face, uh, which is helpful. Obviously, you, you wouldn't want to start from the beginning just to find out you always had something wrong that was going to uh, reject the package. Um, and so it's only that final process. Now, the good news is that the law requires them to do a 30 business day review. And if they don't make a decision at that end of that 30 business days, it's automatically approved. Now, Office of Administrative Law, this is what they do all day and every day. And I've never heard of them once letting a package slip by on accident. They're very good at managing their time. And I've seen very major rulemakings come through. Um, our agency um, helped uh, oversee with the development of uh, the uh, uh, cannabis uh, regulators, specifically the Bureau of Cannabis Control, and they adopted brand new regulations for that entire industry. And we're talking thousands and thousands of pages. Um, and uh, OAL knew it was coming and they set up a, a team to review, but they hit their deadlines as well. So um, I don't think there's concern OAL will not be able to review in time. Um, but it is good to give them some advance notice. Um, I, I should mention right now there is an executive order in place that actually gives them the opportunity to extend at the moment if they're having a hard time meeting their deadlines given the pandemic. Um, however, I've been informed that OAL has yet to rely on that authority. They've been continuing to meet their 30 calendar or 30 business day review timelines. Okay. Thank you. So it sounds like that initial review is for completeness, not for compliance. Okay. That's correct. Um, and then you mentioned that there, um, during the uh, process of the economic impact analysis and and the um, I forget what it was the SRI process. Yeah, yes, yes. Priya, thank you. A concurring signature from finance. Um, how long does I assume they need to do a review to make sure they agree with the analysis? How long does that typically take? And at what level does that signature come? Yes, that's a great question too. Um, and again, we've done fewer of these because just not that many regulations end up having to uh, engage that process. But um, according to their regulations, uh, they uh, request a 90 day review period in advance um, to engage the material. And um, it'll sometimes be a dialogue with staff then about sort of how did you come to these conclusions? Um, there's also a process for them to then uh, provide feedback back or comments or um, back to your SRIA that then do need to be addressed in your notice package. So the tricky one with the timing on all of this is um, as you're sort of teeing up that initial notice package, that notice package is actually going to have to have your completed SRIA already at that time. So you'll be wanting to build that into the front end of the process sort of as you develop the regulations. I think the order will ultimately be draft the regulations and then consider what the economic impact is, develop that SRIA while you develop the rest of the notice package so that then you submit to Department of Finance. Uh, they have up to 90 days, could hopefully, you know, in some cases uh, respond sooner, and then you would provide um, your SRIA then in that notice package. Um, so uh, I guess that's what, yeah, that's the best thing I can say in terms of timing. I, I think you want to you want to try to tee it up so you give them at least 90 days prior to you wanting to file that initial package for, for that 45-day public meeting. Okay. Um, and then a question for the chairperson is, you know, we could get into a discussion of timing on drafting, but that seems to be implicated also in a couple of other agenda items. Um, a question to you if you want to have that conversation now or defer it to some of the later agenda items. I think it makes sense to defer it, understanding that it's definitely something we will want to speak about. And Mr. Laird has graciously volunteered his time as counsel for our meeting. We have no staff, so he is volunteering his time. And so he will also be available for us to um, bring him in as we discuss that. Okay, then I'll hold off on other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. De La Torre, did you have another question or are you ready to move on? I don't have other questions, apologies. 
Thank you very much. In that, thanks to all the board members for um, these excellent questions, which help elucidate a complicated process. Um, thank you again to Mr. Laird for the presentation. Um, I would now like to ask if there is any public comment. Um, Mr. Joseph Panero, is there anyone asking to speak? Certainly. Thank you, Chairperson. It uh, looks we, like we have uh, currently three people in line for public comment. Uh, as a reminder, uh, if you'd like to make a public comment, please press the raised hand, or if you're connected by phone, you may press star nine. Uh, so it looks like our first comment is from Garrett Smith. Uh, Mr. Smith, you have three minutes. So regarding on a follow-up, uh, so I wanted to ask that uh, my question be repeated because I don't feel like it was well understood on the last question. Um, Jennifer Urban interrupted my question to uh, Mr. Laird. Um, I wanted to know uh, who do you discriminate against regarding these public meetings? And I wanted to follow up, and I think this leads into my next question, and specifically what you were talking about with the OAL. Um, it sounds like the board will discriminate against whomsoever they choose and then have the ability to switch the reason just to avoid the protected categories catch. Um, so I wanted to ask now uh, for this appointed board who has been appointed by our government of primarily Democrats, uh, who holds the board accountable? Like, for example, if the board decides to make a decision about a particular case regarding um, new book, a new application called new book, and they've refused a uh, particular uh, data access or, or data portability or something, and, and the board decides to make a decision on that. So who holds them accountable for that? And what's the transparency in that? And I'm coming to this as a, as a consumer who's concerned about transparency and accountability in government. So I want to know who holds this uh, appointed board accountable. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Is your comment complete? Yeah. Thank you. Does the board wish to respond? Thank you for the comment, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment from uh, Arsene Korinian. You have three minutes. Uh, good morning, honorable board members. Uh, my name is Arsene Korinian, and I'm Data Privacy Counsel at Perkins Cui. I want to start off by just congratulate you, congratulating you on your historic appointment as the board members of the states and the nation's first data protection authority. Um, in my practice, I represent businesses across all spectrums of the economy, including retail, tech, healthcare, finance, and e-commerce. And I can say that um, generally from the business community, there's been a very enthusiastic reception to complying with the CPRA. And I know during this uh, agenda item with respect to the CPRA regulations, I think the one thing I just want to emphasize is the importance of just creating a back and forth dialogue so that both businesses and consumers can work together to implement the CPRA in a seamless manner. Um, and I'm hoping that in the future, uh, we can continue this dialogue so that um, uh, businesses are given some practical guidance, similar to how the data protection authorities are set up in Europe, where there will be a consultation period um, and an opportunity to share some pragmatic thoughts on some obstacles that the business community are facing in order to help consumers and um, implement the CPRA, uh, the law and the regulations itself. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we have a comment from Kelly V. Kelly, you have three minutes. Kelly, you are unmuted. We cannot hear you if you're speaking. Kelly? It looks like Looks like we are having an audio issue there. Uh, Kelly, if you'd like to make your comment later, uh, you're welcome to uh, request a comment during the general public uh, comment meeting toward the end of the meeting. Thank you. Uh, we have no further public comments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Panero. I would like to check in to see if the board has any further comments or questions that occurred to members of the board as we were listening to public comment. All right, 
seeing none, before we move to the next agenda item, I'd like to check if people would like a 10 minute break or if you would like to move on um, to the next item, which is another informational presentation. I would prefer to move on to the next item. Okay, everybody, people are nodding. All right. As As there is agreement to continue, we will now move on to agenda item five. Deputy Secretary Tiffany Garcia from the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency will provide a brief report on ongoing administrative work to create the structures necessary to set up the agency and for us to hold this meeting. I'd like to take this opportunity to again thank, thank Deputy Secretary Garcia, Deputy Secretary Mirashidi, and so many um, staff who've been loaning their time uh, to make this meeting possible and to try to help us get started. Um, with that, if you are ready, uh, Deputy Secretary Garcia, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Chairperson Urban. Um, and Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero, for my assigned presentation. We are very excited to help, and I'm very excited to give the board an update on my efforts to date. So next slide, please. So my report will include um, an overview of the administrative and fiscal components in Proposition 24 related to the Privacy Protection Agency, the role of Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, and the administrative functions currently in development, including the next steps. Next slide. So as you heard from my esteemed colleague, I will not get into the specific requirements and deadlines of um, Proposition 24, but I did wanna highlight the agency's enabling statutes and the annual appropriation that was provided for in the initiative. Given the regulatory deadlines and the appropriation included in the initiative, there was a sense of urgency to establish the complex administrative structures so the agency and the board could move quickly and efficiently towards your mandates. The agency's budget is $5 million in the 2021 fiscal year and 10 million in the 21-22 and ongoing with the, an adjustment for cost of living to the extent that the Department of Finance um, works with the board and we need to make those adjustments. I would also note that BCSH worked with the Department of Finance to create these appropriations that were included in the governor's budget, which was released January 10th, 2021. They were reviewed by the legislature and they are currently in the budget bill on the way um, to the governor for signature. Um, and one other point I'd like to highlight is the initiative also required the attorney general's office to provide staff for the agency until the agency hired its own and they may be reimbursed for those services. On this requirement specifically, we have been working closely with the attorney general's office and they have been great partners assisting with the creation of this new agency. Next slide. So the role of BCSH has been to assist with onboarding the board members ensuring your form 700s were filed. I assume many of you received emails from one of my staff, um, Gladys, who has assisted, um, helping with training materials and also setting up this inaugural board meeting. Additionally, my work has been largely focused on establishing the administrative functions for the agency, which include human resources, fiscal operations, procure procurement, and information technology. Next slide. So now I'd like to provide uh, an update on specific administrative activities. So for human resources, the Department of Justice is currently handling this function. So at a high level, what that entails is handling the back end processing of positions in payroll for the board and the agency. To date, I have worked with the state controller's office to set up the pay personnel and payroll structures so the board is ready to hire staff into that structure once you choose to do so. I would also note that while there is an annual appropriation for the agency, no authorized positions exist. So once the board is ready to hire a position, one will need to be requested from the Department of Finance and submitted to the state controller's office so it can be established before it can be filled. Next is fiscal operations. As I mentioned, the proposition does require the attorney general's office to provide staff for the new agency. And that is a little complicated on the fiscal, fiscal side specifically due to the financial information system of California known as FISCAL. 
Fiscal is California's statewide accounting, budget, cash management, and procurement IT system. All state departments are currently required to utilize that system, um, but would note the Department of Justice is deferred. Because the department is currently not on Fiscal, it would not be the most efficient process to call on their staff to assist with setting up the technical fiscal components of this new agency. So to expeditiously get the board and agency up and running in Fiscal, so transactions can concur, for example, covering the costs of this first meeting, I worked with the Department of Consumer Affairs and Fiscal to set up the new agency. And I do just wanna take a moment to thank DCA, the Department of Finance and Fiscal for putting their teams on this to get the board and agency set up so quickly. Um, just to give you a sense of timing, historically it takes about a year for a new entity to onboard onto Fiscal. Um, and again, with my state partners, we were able to do this in about two months. So <laughs> trying to run quickly. Then next, um, beginning on July 1st, fiscal operations, procurement and human resources um, will be transferred to the Department of General Services. Um, and that was really because the Department of Consumer Affairs was a short term solution to get the board set up in the current year. Uh, the Department of General Services does have a section within its department that provides contracted fiscal services, and they are set up to provide administrative services to small and medium sized state departments for a fee. Contracting for these services is needed, as there are obviously no staff for the agency, and oftentimes it can be cost effective for smaller entities to utilize the services of DGS CFS. And now to procurement. The Department of Consumer Affairs, again, is currently set up to provide any procurement support to the extent that the agency needs it within the next few weeks, but that will also move to the Department of General Services starting July 1st. Now, lastly, on information technology, the Department of Consumer Affairs and uh, Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency has worked to establish initial IT support these tasks include requesting a domain, establishing emails, preparing the website, posting board materials online for today's meeting as well. Next slide. And so lastly, I just wanna leave you with a few next steps. So one additional activity that I took on was working with the Department of Finance to transfer funding to the architectural revolving fund to be used for the construction, alteration, repair and improvement of state buildings so really what this means is funds were set aside to be used at a later date by the board for an office space or offices once you choose the location or locations. So once that space or spaces are identified, these funds can also be used for the maintenance improvements and equipment of that facility. Um, and as I mentioned, starting July 1st, the administration, administration functions will continue and I'm working with the Department of General Services and actually contracting with them for, again, fiscal operations, procurement, and human resources. Uh, I just would note that the Department of General Services does not provide IT support, so that will stay with the Department of Consumer Affairs for the time being. And then again, having all of the services at least as centrally located as possible um, helps for better internal coordination of activities and also reporting to the state control entities. And finally, establishing positions. So that is obviously very critical for the board because you have um, a lot of work ahead of you. And the next agenda item will present the initial hiring strategy. But I just wanna note that the back end pieces are in place to establish positions once you are ready. Um, in coordination, I will work with the State Controller's Office and the Department of Finance to do so, and happy to continue to be here to assist you all um, in your great work ahead. So thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Garcia. Um, let's begin with any questions or comments from board members. Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you, Chairperson Urban, and, and thank you, Ms. Garcia, for, for all the help and support. Starting a new agency is a huge task, uh, as we're all finding out. So, um, you know, uh, the, the chair used this term, take, take us under your wing, which uh, seems appropriate. So thank you for that. 
Um, I have a, a couple of questions uh, on your presentation. One is around the attorney general providing staff. Um, do we have in information or can we get information on how the attorney general's office staffed this function? The, the attorney general has had rulemaking authority in this area, how they staffed it, how many people they had, what position types they utilized, uh, which could perhaps provide us a template of what our resource needs might be. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. And then, you know, is there the possibility of some of those people being seconded to us um, while we seek to staff up, they have experience in the area and, and perhaps, is there a process by which either the statutory authority or underlying authorities in, in the state code for that to happen? So yes, so again, back to your first question. So absolutely happy to engage with the Attorney General on the specific resources that they currently utilize uh, for efforts to date in this space. I would just note one point, the Attorney General does have classifications that are specific to the Department of Justice. For They have Deputy Attorney Generals. So that would not be a classification that could be established under this new agency. But you could obviously hire your own Attorney Counsel, all of those functions. Um, and then in terms of, and can you repeat your second question? I apologize. Sure. Well, part of it was, you know, I don't know if they've got a section uh -huh. headed by a deputy AG and they've got 12 people in it, whatever the, the structure and, and resourcing they've been utilizing. And then is it possible to get some of those folks detailed or seconded to us to help accelerate our, our process? Uh, cause I think, um, Phil's presentation on timing, uh, probably, uh, Put the, put the fear of the calendar in all of us. Yes, so I would just note that is obviously, we stepped in to assist the board. It is an independent entity, autonomous, absolutely. So that was not, not something that BCSH wanted to take on in terms of getting that staff for you. But if that is the direction that the board so chooses to go, happy to engage in conversations with the attorney general about redirecting or loaning staff for these efforts, because that is, very clear in the proposition that they shall provide support. Thank you. Um, and then a kind of a, a minor, more technical question. The facilities portion that you discussed, um, is that, did what I heard you say, I'm trying to make sure I heard this correctly, was funds have been set aside. Were those funds set aside from the 2021 fiscal year appropriation? Have we already obligated those funds so they come out of the 2021? budget? So they, yes, they are set aside in uh, from the $5 million. Okay. So there's $4 million set aside. So basically you don't lose that funding because if not, it will revert to the general fund. So we did make a decision to put uh, $4 million aside in the architectural revolving fund to be used at a later date by the board. That was a wise decision. Thank you. Uh, those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Are there other questions from members of the board? Ms. Garcia, could you say a little bit about um, any need for authority to continue the process? Um, yes. So again, for a later agenda item, there is a going to be agenda item seven specifically, um, the conversation about delegating authority either to the chair or an executive director. So obviously there is no executive director or candidate to date because we have not even um, posted that position. We still have to work with, again, our state control agencies, including finance and state controllers office and CalHR to uh, establish the position. But what I would need from the board in terms of next steps would be delegating the administrative authority over so we can continue these activities. As I mentioned, the Department of General Services is available to step in July 1st, but I have not entered any contract into any contracts on behalf of the board or agency for those functions to date. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Any other questions from the board? All right. Is there any public comment from those in the audience? I'm not seeing any chairperson. Uh, as a reminder to members of the public, uh, please raise your hand or press star nine if you're connected by telephone, if you would like to make a public comment. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Panero. 
I am going to pause briefly again to ask again if anybody would like a break or if you would like to move into the next agenda item. We will take a break for lunch um, around 12 or 12.30, depending on whether we're in between agenda items. Mr. Thompson. Uh, just a, a process question. I don't know if somebody is capturing action items or follow-ups that we will hear at the end. Um, Cause I just, I realized I just asked Ms. Garcia for a report on the attorney general staffing levels. So I made a note about that, but I, I wanna ensure that we're capturing those actions as we go. Yes, the meeting is being recorded and Mr. Christopher Phillips is taking minutes. Uh, thank you to him. He's another BCSH staff person. Shall we move on to uh, the next agenda item, which is agenda item number six? All right, thank you. Um, agenda item number six flows um, directly from Ms. Garcia's presentation, and I think also from Mr. Laird's presentation about the timelines, the strict timelines under which we are operating. I would like to um, turn the board members' agenda attention, excuse me, to the agenda item six materials in your meeting packet, um, which are um, sort of a partial um, partial um, documentation of, of what we are going to discuss. Um, so the, the board um, needs to uh, help the agency accomplish uh, quite a bit within the next year. Um, and at the same time, the board needs to actually create the agency. So we have a little bit of a parallel um, series of activities we need to undertake in order to fulfill our responsibilities under the CPRA. With advice from staff, I have come up with an initial plan for us to discuss, um, and it involves um, a few components. The first uh, are related to the two duty statements that are in your materials. The, um, so the the CPRA um, directs us at section 1798.199.30 to, to appoint an executive director. Um, it is, leaves the executive director um, position um, otherwise up to us. There are a couple of different very important critical functions that the board and the agency need at the moment. Um, two types of expertise, to be specific. The first is substantive expertise, by which I mean expertise required to oversee the agency's substantive responsibilities, most urgently, the rulemaking that must be done by next year, and the public education and guidance responsibilities of the board that are ongoing. Um, this also would involve coordinating with the Office of the Attorney General, other jurisdictions, and eventually enforcement. Um, the job will require, for example, knowledge of privacy and data protection law and practice, consumer and citizen interests, business interests, technical issues related to data flows, com the complex political backdrop against which we are operating, and so forth. The second set of expertise that the agency urgently needs is someone with experience in state agency development and management with the knowledge required to set up all the processes and systems the agency will require, who's knowledgeable about relevant civil service rules, reporting requirements, and the like. My view is that it is possible that both sets of expertise could reside in one person, but it is perhaps unlikely. Regardless, my view is that it would be difficult, if not impossible, for one person to be able to do both jobs at once, particularly on the timelines that we are tasked with. For this reason, I propose that as the first part of the plan we're discussing, we advertise for two positions. One executive director who is focused more on the substantive responsibilities of the agency and overall leadership, and one chief deputy director of administration who is more focused on the administrative operations and building out the agency. The draft duty statements describe the basic expected parameters of the jobs. Once advertised, these jobs must be posted for a minimum length of time. I believe is it at least, at least 30 days, and um, I apologize if I don't have that exactly right. 
Um, staff could help identify top candidates. All of this has to interact properly with Bagley Keene, of course. Um, the other things to back up and say, the other things that I'm trying to balance um, is the ability to do the work efficiently um, and appropriately and properly uh, while recognizing that this is a volunteer board um, and we, um, everyone will have a certain amount of time to, to devote to it. Um, top candidates for the executive director position, and we can talk about you know, how many the board would like to see, would then be interviewed and um, considered by the board in closed session. I would expect two to four candidates, depending on the strength of the pool and the board's expressed preferences. Ultimately, of course, the, vote, the board will vote to appoint the preferred candidate. We can follow a similar process for candidates for the chief deputy director of administration position, or the board could decide to delegate me um, to hire for that position. Again, it's really down to how much input the board would like to have into that position um, uh, compared against the, the resources um, that board members have and the various things that the board and the agency need to do. This would be in, um, in tandem with exploring options that um, Mr. Thompson brought up uh, as we talked about the last um, agenda um, item and as Ms. Garcia described, um, where we are requesting support um, from other agencies. As of July 1st, some of the administrative support would be from the General Services Agency um, and we would be exploring with the Attorney General's Office um, what is available for substantive legal support. My view is that we should begin the process of looking for and hiring leadership without delay because we are operating under some very strict timelines. That is my view. Um, when we are finished discussing this, my, um, my plan is for us to consider an action item um, that would um, consolidate um, a plan to go forward between now and the next board meeting for us to consider. With that, are there any, um, oh, and I should also, um, I should also note that the duty statements describe the, the jobs. Um, uh, they are draft, we can talk about those as well. And job uh, postings in addition can add things like qualifications that you would like to see. Um, so those would be most gratefully received if that is something that people would like to talk about during discussion. So with that, um, I would like to open it up to board questions and comments and discussion. Ms. Sierra, Ms. sorry, Ms. De La Torre, Ms. Sierra, and then Mr. Lay, please. Um, I was wondering if we have given consideration to the idea of also hiring for a general counsel for the agency. I think that's typically one of the you know, positions that are required and it will be really helpful to think about it as soon as possible. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. That's um, a very astute comment. I agree with you. I should back up and say that my, my sort of understanding of having looked at different agencies and um, boards that have been developed, of which there are not that many, um, the usual practice is to ask the executive director to come up with a draft org chart um, and to make initial important hires. The general counsel would absolutely be in that bucket. Given that we do not start with an executive director, I think that if the board would, again, it's time, if the board would like to, um, to have the board appoint a general counsel, I would certainly support that um, and could work with staff to create the duty statement and all of those things um, for us to consider at the next meeting or the board could even delegate me to go ahead and do that. Um, and we could start looking for candidates. So I think this is a question for um, how the board would like to organize itself. And I absolutely agree that the general counsel is an important early appointment. Ms. Sierra? Yes, thank you. Um, on the, just to dovetail on those remarks, you know, if 
all things being equal and we had more time, you know, I would feel, I, I like this idea and I think it makes a lot of sense of breaking up these two functions because it may be very difficult to find somebody as you uh, mentioned, um, enough candidates with both the substantive expertise and management expertise. Um, but, you know, all things being equal, if we had more time, I would be more on, um, my preference would be to be able to get the input from the new executive director, even on this, you know, the um, other role that we're talking about, maybe like the chief of staff role or the deputy director. Um, I don't know if we have that luxury in this situation, unfortunately, but I would, I do feel that it would be important for the executive director to have the input on the general counsel. That, that would be my, my thought at this point. Um, and on this other issue about, you know, breaking up or having, you know, initially bringing on two um, executives, um, what I would suggest that while you know we go in that direction, that while we're looking for an executive director, I think it would be really helpful to the agency that if we could get candidates that had some management experience, because I think that will be incredibly important for an executive director. You know, it may not be you know somebody that's you know created a new agency or a new program, but I do think some management experience or some you know actually with some depth would be important for the agency. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Yes, I agree with you that the executive director, of course, will need to have a, um, a very productive working relationship um, with um, the person who's heading the administration. And that is something that we will need to consider carefully. I, um, I have jotted down management experience as something that we could add to the list of criteria for the job posting, if that makes sense to you. We could also work it in in another fashion. Great, that thing that makes sense. And the other just comment I have, I thought this the duty statements um, were really well done. And the one thing that I suggest that we may want to add to perhaps both of the duty statements is some reference. I think it's implied in there about um, that their jobs, you know, especially initially, there's going to be a quite a bit of recruitment and hiring that they are involved in. And, you know, unlike most positions in the state where you are applying for a job in an agency that's already been developed, you know, that's something that's going to be unique and that's going to be a very important part of their function. So I, it, it may be worthwhile to weave that in into the duty statements a little more explicitly. Thank you. Mr. Lay. Uh, thank you, Chair, for, for this plan. You know, I, I was wondering how we were going to get someone that had both, uh, that could stand up an agency and handle the rulemaking, but I, I think this plan of splitting it up makes sense. Um, and I, you know, as to the point about, you know, the postings, I think it might be helpful to just maybe get the postings out for the general counsel, but um, I mean, just approve it and then maybe stagger it. So perhaps by the time the ED is selected, that job posting will have already been out there. So one of their first tasks could be to vet those people. I mean, that timing could work out. Um, and I guess my other question was around what's the process for, you know, us, you know, there's going to be a closed session interview, but what's the process for us vetting um, you know the resumes that come in uh, beforehand you know we'll be doing that independently but can we talk to the you know the candidates independently what's what are kind of the rules around that um so i may have to ask mr laird to correct me on this um the the the, the short answer is the board can um, develop the process that it would like um, it does have to comply with Bagley Key. Um, so for that reason, my understanding is that at each level, we would have to be holding a meeting, a public meeting that some of which may be in closed session, um, which is why my initial thought was that we would, um, we, had, we don't know how many applications we're going to get, but my initial thought would be um, to do the screening at an earlier stage and um, have hot, top, top candidates um, come before the board in a closed session. Um, now we could put some parameters on that or um, we could um, 
uh, we could come up with another plan. Um, this just seemed to be the way to try to balance, again, sort of efficacy and efficiency with the ability for the board um, to have um, oversight of the position. Mr. Laird, did I get that mostly right? You, you got that correct. Um, you know, if, if the board wants to be involved every step of the way, that's absolutely fine. Um, but that would require a properly noticed meeting, even if most of those deliberations would be occurring in closed session. Um, so, uh, you know, I think how then you would see that is a minimum of 10 day intervals then between sort of each step for the board to kind of convene and take that into consideration. So my preference would be for the board to give me clear direction um, on what to work with staff to look for in the initial um, in the initial sort of set of applications. And if there are, you know, gray areas, of course, to come back to the board with that, that would be my preference because I think that that is efficient and I would feel comfortable that I understood what the board was looking for, but we could do something else. Mr. Thompson? Thank you. Um, this is, I feel like this is a really big decision and, and it's gonna have a lot of ramifications for the operations and culture of this agency on a, on a go forward basis. So I'm glad that we're, we're getting it getting it going and getting these posted. As you mentioned, you know, what the qualification, the, the, we need a kind of a statement of qualifications for these positions to make clear what kind of candidates we're looking for. Um, you know, I, I think you you rightly point to a tension between getting moving and and making good hiring decisions. Um, I think I might I might balance those a little bit differently because I see a period of time of I don't know how long six months I'm making that up of really startup and this person the executive director is going to need to be an outstanding people manager um, and have an ability to hire, um, the ability to, 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 to interview and hire candidates who will comport with the culture we want to build, the, the, the type of agency we want to build, I think is, is really critical. Um, which is why in my head, I'm thinking about importing the, the substantive expertise that exists already in the in the attorney general's office so that they can get help us get started on that track while really leading I mean, this person's going to be our leader uh, the, uh, for the staff so that that to me is is really i think uh, the way i i would kind of balance those tensions if if we can um because i the other, I think, advantage of bringing in people who have already been working in this space for the state is then it relieves some of the pressure to rush. Because um, I, everything we we have a lot of stuff we got to move really quickly on. Um, hiring decisions tend to be lasting decisions and hard to change subsequently. So being thoughtful and deliberate in that process is, is very is important to me. Um, so th those are my my thoughts and observations that I that I wanted to share. Um, how those get incorporated into our our proceeding, um, I think, is subject to further discussion. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Delatore. Thank you. Um, to follow up to the comments um, that I really agree with uh, from Mr. Thompson, um, I think there is. It seems to me we have to hire an executive director. That's a position that is identified in the law. And I think that we are all in agreement that that has to happen immediately. But beyond that, I think that we have to be thoughtful, not only in terms of who we select, but also in terms of whether we're talking about exempt positions or civil service positions, and what are the differences between those two. And I was hoping if we have Mr. Lear there um, to kind of educate us a little bit. Perhaps he can help us understand what the difference is between an exempt position, a non-exempt position, what are the um, requirements or the, uh, you know, the boundaries around um, employees that are um, civil service and how other agencies have dealt with the complexities of um, these requirements in, um, in uh, California administrative law. Thank you, Ms. Salatori. Yes, 
The executive director position is exempt, it's in the statute. My understanding is that also our chief privacy auditor is exempt um, as set forth in the statute. And then after that, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so I really appreciate the question and um, would ask Mr. Laird if he could respond. And if it's all right, I might actually defer to my colleague, uh, <laughs> Ms. Garcia, who's uh, expert in these things. <laughs> Yes, thank you for the question. So yes, the executive director and the auditor are exempt positions because they are in statute, so not subject to civil service rules. After that, whatever positions you would like to create and establish would be civil service positions. So really what that means is subject to pay, benefits, discipline, um, termination um, as agreed uh, to by whatever bargaining units those positions are a part of. Um, so again, subject to collective bargaining, again, depending on the classifications, um, happy to discuss this further because it, it gets super weedy again. If you want, if we're talking hiring an attorney, which is subject to case, it's bargaining unit two, they have their own specific requirements versus our generalist classifications, for example, like analysts, supervisors, managers. Um, and I would just also note that in your handbook, which you are going to discuss later, there is just a brief high level summary about agency positions and civil service versus exempt. Um, one note I would though also make is there are CEA positions, which is a career executive assignment position. And those are at will employees. So to the extent that you would like to create those positions um, and based on a chairperson Urban's recommendation, so the admin position, that could be a CEA position. We go to um, the Department of Human Resources to request that, establish it. There are certain timelines for that to be advertised just to actually create it versus then advertising for recruitment. But what uh, that level of position gives you is the administrative flexibility to terminate um, that uh, candidate um, based on your decisions at any point. So a little flexibility there again for civil service rules. And so so um, follow up question on that, in terms of the interviewing process, is there a particular process for interviewing that is set for uh, civil service um, positions versus perhaps there's more flexibility for the exempt positions? Absolutely, so there is more flexibility for exempt positions. It, it pretty much you can do almost anything you would like you wouldn't necessarily have to even receive a, a resume. They wouldn't even have to apply. You can, the board can decide, I found this person off the street and I would like to appoint them into that position. You can do that for an, ex an exempt position. Civil service, they have to meet minimum qualifications. Again, depending on the classifications, there are examinations that they would have to take to be eligible to fall into that position. And then I, I think my colleague wanted to, oh yeah. The deputy direct, chief deputy director of administration position, um, I was thinking of as a CEA position. Ms. Garcia, a, a general counsel would often be a C or would always be a CEA position as well, is that correct? It often is a CEA position as well, yes. And the board, would the board be able to identify maybe a first set of positions that it would like to be CEA positions? Absolutely. So if that's something either you, the chair would like to do, or once you hire an executive director, if we wanna have a rough draft organization chart, we can go through that and submit. Again, the, the one piece with establishing CEAs, which is a little bit more complex than either the exempt or any civil service position, is there is a package and justification that does need to be approved by, again, CalHR, before we could even advertise. And that ha it is noticed to the public for 30 days about creating that type of position. Ms. Taylor Tori, did you have a follow-up question? Right, no, I was, um, I'm just thinking about what are the things where we seem to be all in agreement versus the things that might need a little bit more conversation. And as I noted before, I think the hiring of the executive director should be a priority and we should definitely move forward on that. Um, perhaps we have to identify some form of delegation to um, come up with a list of uh, candidates that can be interviewed by the board. Um, 
beyond that, it seems to, that there is an agreement on, on hiring a general counsel. It's just that we might um, want to, some of us might want to delay that. And then there is the last position is the position that uh, uh, Chairman Urban suggested. And uh, we, I'm, I'm not sure where the other members are in terms of, of the necessity of, of that position. Perhaps um, Mrs. Urban can better summarize that. Uh, thank you. I will, but I would first like to give Ms. Sierra and Mr. Lay um, the opportunity to speak. See. Great, thank you. Um, one question, and maybe this is for Tiffany. Um, I'm not sure we may have to consult with somebody else. For um, the CEA positions, for example, the executive director or the chief deputy um, director of administration, you know, if we pursue, you know, the, the, the mode of advertising for the position and trying to get, you know, that advertisement out as widely as possible. So, you know, we're, you know, very sure um, many, you know, folks know about this. Is there um, a time limit in which we must hire? As I think in civil service hiring, my recollection is that, you know, once you post um, an advertisement, you have a certain amount of time to make your hire. So I'd be um, curious about that because that could impact uh, how we move forward because um, we may want to stagger, you know, the um, advertisements. And also, in you know, listening to this, our conversation, which I think has been really helpful and the different perspectives, you know, one, one approach we may want to consider is start initially with the executive director position you know, and just see what the candidate pool looks like before deciding should we move forward before the hire is made for the second position, or do we have such a robust and strong candidate pool that we're likely going to be able to make a hire very quickly. So st staggering of the positions um, may be something that we could pursue. And um, in terms of, you know, you were asking about other criteria to look for in the executive director, um, a couple other thoughts um, that, you know, I think would be um, helpful to be very explicit about in our advertisement is given the nature of this new agency and the importance of this new agency, it would be very helpful to find candidates who have a demonstrated experience working with stakeholders and a, a very diverse group of stakeholders. Um, as well as individuals who have either worked in government agencies, you know, or worked with government agencies. I think those could be very key in um, someone helping someone become successful in this role. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Yeah, um, so I had, I guess my question around, you know, I, I'm hearing that uh, there's, there's some resistance to the deputy director of administration. As far as I understood is that this person would kind of do a lot of the administrative work, right? Putting the postings out there, but the executive director would be the one that was actually making the choices on who to hire and would be able to create hires that, uh, oh, hire the people that create the culture. So, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on that, that perspective, because um, I do think there is just a lot of administrative work um, that you know may not be the best use of the ED's time as as we're as they're working on getting the regulations the substantive regulations ready. Um, and then the other you know question I had was kind to of what uh, you know uh, Ms. De La Torre was mentioning is you know I think we all have agreement that we uh, need to get this ED hire done quickly. And so I guess my question is like what is but it also sounds like we want to make some edits to the job description. So. Uh, you know, in terms of next steps, like what is the fastest way that we can get that job posting out and make those edits? Um, is it today, do we have to have another meeting uh, on those edits first? Um, is there just any clarity on that? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, Ms. Delatoire, do you want to um, weigh in again? And then I will try to summarize the conversation. I'm not going to summarize. I need to summarize so I don't forget where we are. <laughs> right. I think it's, you know, the raising the hand is, is a little, because we're all having our conversation, but. You're on mute, Ms. Delatoy. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes. Go ahead and summarize it. I'm just 
raising my hand because I want to continue to participate in the conversation. I think that um, the summary is a, a good part. Of it. All right. Um, so um, I've heard uh, a number a number of things. Um, um, one thing is that there is broad consensus to move forward on the executive director position. I am unsure of where Mr. Thompson is on that at this point. Um, there are, um, I believe, we haven't had as much of a discussion of the um, piece uh, that would allow me to work with Ms. Garcia and others to look for, um, uh, look for sort of temporary support from the Attorney General's office and others, but that's another piece of it. Then there's the question of the uh, Deputy Director of Administration. Um, Mr. Lay points out that there is a lot of work to be done there and asked, um, asked the question about hiring. Uh, so the Executive Director is like the chairperson in the statute in that the Executive Director can be delegated by the board uh, to basically do things on behalf of the agency other than rulemaking and enforcement. So hiring power would both under the law and as I understand it in general practice, pass through the executive director as Mr. Lay was suggesting. At the same time, I could imagine the executive director delegating to the deputy director of administration to go and hire for, for example, HR positions or to do that kind of thing. Again, the board could give the executive director fairly detailed direction, um, or we could choose not to do that. But that is my understanding and intent behind the proposed structure. Concerns about the deputy director of administration um, position uh, involve, among other things, the fact that the executive director really needs to be the leader of the agency. Um, and um, I'm paraphrasing here, so please forgive me and correct me if I got wrong the, um, the underlying issue here. The executive director will need to work closely, of course, with the deputy director of administration. Um, and that would be someone that uh, we might not want to um, hire sort of under the executive director without the executive director's input. So one idea for managing that would be for the executive to start with the executive director and stagger the posting of the positions um, with the thought that if we are able to put in place an executive director um, in time for the executive director to have considered input on the deputy director of administration. And I will say we could even decide to have the executive director be the person to appoint the deputy director of administration. I'm not kind of hearing appetite for that sort of authority at the moment in the conversation, but we could. Um, then that might be one way um, to organize it. Ms. Sierra also pointed out that that would allow us to review the applications we get for the executive director and kind of you know see what we get and whether we do find um, all of those um, abilities embodied in one person. At the same time, as Mr. Lay um, points out, and with whom I agree, um, there is a lot of work that has to happen on the administrative side. It is very specialized. It requires a lot of knowledge of California agencies and how California agencies operate. Um, and so I'm a little bit skeptical about that, but it is certainly a possibility. Um, I have not said much about the process for seeking um, support from other offices, um, but I believe that that is something that the board generally is in favor of. And so as I currently see the situation, we should um, finish up our discussion of how we might want to approach the executive director position. Um, and I have received some thoughts on the duty statement, specifically to be sure that it's very clear that hiring will be a large part of the job, especially initially, so hiring an organization. It is within, it's in the duty statement, but it could be more prominently stated. Perhaps similarly for the Deputy Director of Administration, um, and I have received um, thoughts for 
um, uh, uh, characteristics that are um, necessary for the job, management experience, um, again, experience with hiring and managing personnel, uh, the ability to work with stakeholders, and, and I wasn't sure if this was essential or if this was desired, experience working within or with government agencies. Um, I'm sure I have managed to leave something out, but I hope that I have summarized the conversation effectively thus far. As to how we could accomplish that, there are two things that we could do at least. The first would be for the board to delegate to me the authority to move ahead with the executive director um, position, taking into account what we have decided in this meeting. The second um, would be um, that perhaps uh, we're getting close to time for a break for lunch. Um, I could make some edits and show those to you to the duty statement, or I could put the duty statement up and we could actually look at the language together um, if that is something that the board would prefer. Um, either way is fine with me, and I'm sure Mr. Lyric will tell us if we are, if we're doing something um, the wrong way and we need to change tack. All right, I would like to now pause and go back to hear from Mr. Thompson and then Ms. De La Torre. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. I think you summarized the discussion really well and, and captured kind of um the views and sentiments at least at least mine um uh, you know again there's tension here between speed and and impact and permanence and um i i think i think you posed a question or you asked kind of where i was i think we need to post the executive director job immediately um i'm comfortable also well let me ask a question um the folks who suggested hiring a general counsel are they con conceiving of that position as being a substantive position meaning that person is going to be well steeped in in this area of law and regulation or a general counsel in stressing the general part that they would advise us on employment law and everything else that that goes into the legal advice that an agency would need because i could think of it in two different ways um, but I don't know if which way we're thinking of it, because it, it would make sense to me to hire three those three positions, presuming the GC is a sub is a substantive position, um, and or at least post them all immediately, get them moving immediately, um, with the idea of getting those folks in place as fast as we can. I think we have to be realistic about the time from posting to the time that somebody's in their seat. Um, it seems like that would be at minimum three months um, and could be longer. I mean, we have the thing has to be posted for 30 days. We'll have a process. We have to have a meeting. Um, we have to interview. The person has to give notice. Um, I don't know if I'm thinking about that wrong, but that seems easily three months from now. Um, it worries me to lose that time for, for all the things we need to do. Well, let me one thing. I agree with you in a, in a perfect world, the executive director would have a say in hiring those positions. We're not in a perfect world, we're under a time pressure. So I think we have to sacrifice that to some extent and make that decision. And, and the executive director will just have to understand that we hired some of those other senior positions in the interest of time. Um, I'm comfortable with that. I don't know if others are. Um, I think because it could be a multi-month process to get those senior leaders in place, having some sort of interim executive director who is guiding this work makes sense to relieve a little, at least a little bit of the time pressure. Um, I would love to, if we can find out on the break, find out how senior of a person at the attorney general's office is leading this function. If it is a senior leader, uh, in, in, can we get that person on an interim basis or somebody analogous on an interim basis who can start to work? Um, both substantively, mostly on the substantive side, but to some extent, I presume that person would have some experience in, in directing a state agency or, or at least a component of the state agency. So I would like to dual track those things um, to the extent that that is feasible. Um, I don't have a strong sense of how, how feasible it is, but the, the question, I think the immediate question is posting the positions um, as modified, however they are modified per our discussion, 
And then is it possible to bring in somebody on a temporary basis? That, that's how I'm thinking about it. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. I, I think I neglected to thank um, Chairman Irvin for the thoughtful work that he's done and for presenting uh, you know, an alternative here. And I, I really appreciate um, all of that. The, um, my hesitation on the Deputy Director of Administration position comes from my um, expectation that as we are hiring for the Executive Director, this will be a person that will come with a vision for what the agency is supposed to be. And that vision will include a vision of the structure of the agency. Um, and um, the second piece of it is I, I do strongly believe that the leadership positions within the agency um, should be either exempt or CEA positions, which is going to add a layer of delay, which I um, you know, regret as we are looking for um, getting this uh, process for the rulemaking uh, started as soon as possible. But at the same time, I think for a long-term uh, functionality of the agency, we'll, you don't hire for short term, like um, Mr. Mr. Thompson mentioned before you have to have more of a, a long-term vision around it. Um, so with, with that said, um, I, I go back to what um, Borman Sierra mentioned, which is that we should think about the staggering. And de facto, I think that we have to stagger because the executive director position could be posted tomorrow as an exempt position, but if we want either the general counsel position or the deputy director of administration position to go next, they first are gonna to have to go through a review to be able to be CEA positions, right? So we're de facto, I think, looking at the staggering which brings me back to what Mr. Thompson mentioned about the urgency of seeking support, uh, hopefully from the um, AG office in terms of the staff that they um, th that has the capacity and the knowledge to help the rulemaking process start as soon as possible. And on the rulemaking process, and I'm not sure if this is the right part of the meeting to mention it, but I will definitely favor opening a comment period before we put forward our first version of the rulemaking, which is an informal process, um, but I think it will be really, really helpful. And it doesn't really ne necessitate the analysis. It's just you know identifying a process so that we can intake those comments. And that might take you know a month or two at the minimum um, before we have those comments and we can start to analyze them. And I also think that at the uh, at that point the staff that will be doing the analysis um, is likely gonna be um, not necessarily the um, executive director, but hopefully staff that we can um, ask the attorney general to lend to us to, to start um, the process of drafting the initial version of the regulations with, you know, directed by the executive and director, but, um, I guess what I'm trying to point out is that some of the staff that we urgently need is not necessarily the leadership staff, but just more the day-to-day um, -day staff that can actually read thousands of pages because we, we're likely, you know, I, I, I've seen the comments to the prior version of the rules and, and it was li literally thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. Um, so um, I hope that expresses my position and, and, and my um, hesitation around the idea of the deputy Director of Administration. I just, quite honestly, it's not a position that I was expecting or I'm familiar with. Maybe it is six in other agencies. I just, I'm not familiar with it. And I will want to avoid um, kind of setting up the agency in a way that might not be aligned with the vision that the executive director that we eventually hire has for the agency. Thank you, Ms. Delatoy. We will have to table discussion of regulation process and substance until the correct agenda item, um, but I appreciate how all of this fits together. And I have in return um, a question um, for you, which is I absolutely agree. Um, and as I understand from speaking with staff that the CEA positions um, do require additional process. So we have an automatically staggered um, process 
if we were to go ahead and start putting all of that in motion um, tomorrow. And my question is, would you be comfortable with that, um, given that there's an automatically staggered process, or would you prefer um, instead to wait longer on the deputy director of administration? And it's all right if you'd like to think for a moment, we can move on. I, I, I'm absolutely comfortable with that for the general counsel position because I see that as a necessary position. I don't know that there is any agency that doesn't have a general counsel. So we, we, we should move forward with that. I would like to have a little bit more information on the deputy director of administration, whether this is a model that exists in other, in other agencies. And in particular, how, how does the deputy director of administration position interact with the executive director? You know, what, what's the dynamic there? Um, because it might not, I'm not sure that it needs to be a CEA position if it's reporting directly to the executive director, but at the same time, it just seems, um, you know, it seems a little odd to be hiring for a position that reports to somebody who we haven't hired yet, basically. I, I don't know the answer to sort of a statistical analysis of agencies in California. Um, the Fair Political Practices Commission has an executive director, a uh, director of, of legal um, or a legal director, a director of administration, and a director of enforcement. That's, that's how it, it's set up. So um, that is in part the um, model um, for, for the position. Ms. Sierra and then Mr. Lay. Thank you. Um, I'm comfortable with that, just the natural staggering that, that would happen um, with the three positions as well to get that going. Um, with, and I do think um, it is really important. I fully support the exploring with the Attorney General's office um, as Mr. Thompson has been talking about to see um, with respect to if we can retain them as you know, staff, especially with the drafting of the regulations and working with us with outreach and forums and things like that. I think there may be um, more difficulties and limitations around having someone from the attorney general's office serve in a temporary leadership position within the new agency. I think that might be, I'm not, you know, I think there may be just limitations statutorily or otherwise. I'm not sure about that, but um, because I think then as Mr. Thompson brought up, it may be helpful to have someone in that role like in the interim. Um, but another um, potential for just somebody to help in the interim with respect to administrative processes, because I know the business consumer services and housing agency are having to provide a lot of support for us right now, you know, and they have a lot of other um, business to attend to that we may want to consider bringing somebody we have there's limited term positions that sometimes you can bring somebody who from, you know, uh, another state agency, you know, that is willing to work for a limited amount of time to help, um, you know, jumpstart a particular um, project, you know, or, you know, a department, but there that may be a way that we go or could consider just to be able to get some of that administrative help on an interim basis before the executive director can really think about the team that they really want to build, like what their executive team um, should look look like, and what type of skill sets they're you know balancing with each other. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Yeah, uh, I guess you know in, in terms of just next steps, uh, you, there was two options. We could delegate to you the power to work with. Um, Ms. Garcia on this job posting, as well as um, maybe using this break time to get our, you know, qualification edits in for the um, for the uh, ED position. So, um, do can we move to do that? Uh, you know, I, I, if possible, I'd like to get that that posting out today, if we could, or at least give you the authority to get the posting out today, if you could. So. Uh, what, yeah, what are the steps to, for us to make that vote? Thank you. Um, as I understand it, the steps well, are for us to take public comment, um, to find out if the board has any other comments after that. Um, and then we can formulate a motion that looks the way we would like it, and we can vote um, on that motion. Um, and that could include 
you know, waiting for me to actually make some edits, or it could it could be that the board um, expects me to um, reflect the conversation with the board um, and make sure that the duty statement and the job description uh, conform to that. Um, so that is what we could do. I um, we also um, could add to that, and I think it's probably a good idea, um, the component of having me um, explore with Ms. Garcia and Ms. Mirshidi, whoever is appropriate, uh, what, is, um, what options are available um, for help from the Attorney General's office. I want to be sure that we have appropriate expectations. Um, the Attorney General's office has been a terrific partner. It's a small team. Um, and they are very highly tasked. So I just want to be sure that everyone is aware that there may be practical limitations to what they can provide, but I but they have, you know, I know that they intend to be a good partner. I just want to be sure that, that folks under understand um, that there, there are probably some practical limitations um, to what to what they can provide. Like we won't be able to have like a full staff of attorneys drafting regulations. Um, seconded to us from the Attorney General's office is my expectation. Further comments from the board at the moment? Mr. Lay. So when we uh, delegate the task um, to you, I guess like what is, uh, what are your next steps and what you're gonna have to do to get that posting out and uh, to what extent can, you know, us other board members uh, take a load off? Because you've, you've definitely been doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. Thank you. I appreciate that a great deal. Um, and so to sort of back up and play the whole conversation through, here's what I propose. I propose that I take the conversation that we have had today I use that to modify the duty statement for the executive director and produce the job listing, which looks a little bit different, making sure that it takes into account all of the uh, qualities uh, that the board has um, stated are necessary for that position um, and work with Ms. Garcia and other appropriate staff to get that posted as soon as possible. Secondly, that I work with uh, Ms. Garcia and other staff to um, develop the appropriate and get to CalHR the appropriate packages for the de Chief Deputy Director of Administration. And I know Ms. De La Torre would like us to move on general counsel. Um, I, I want to be sure that the board is in agreement um, on whether to do that. Those would begin, start sort of moving through the process. Um, then it kind of comes down to when we have our next board meeting, I think. Um, uh, but I would imagine that um, staff would help me do an initial review of the applications for the executive director with the hope that I could bring to the board in our next meeting um, a um, series of high level candidates for the board to interview in closed session. Um, and then if the board is prepared, the board could then deliberate on those candidates and make an appointment decision. The other um, positions would be moving on that slower timeline. Um, so um, I expect it would take longer. Now, Mr. Thompson points out um, that there are practical limitations to how quickly a lot of this can happen. Um, so it is possible uh, that the, the sort of interviewing um, interviewing would need to happen then the board would want more time before deliberating or we would need to wait a little bit longer before we were actually able to interview that first candidate. In parallel with that, um, I would work with, um, with um, Ms. Garcia and others um, to work with the Attorney General's office to see what, um, what possibilities there are um, for support expertise, sort of support that is expert support um, for the rulemaking process. I will say, um, when we get to the subcommittee agenda item to your last point, Mr. Lay, um, there are certain things that we could um, appoint a subcommittee so that at least there were two of us 
um, working on some of those um, on some of those items. Um, and we could, I think we could, I think that we could um, figure that out and maybe even amend things slightly at that point in the meeting if we chose to do so. Um, so that is my understanding. Um, I will um, ask now for public comment. Um, and then actually I will ask first Mr. Laird if that sounds right to you um, in terms of the kind of uh, action that we could choose to take um, and then be sure that we have time for public comment. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, as long as there's a motion and a vote on, on this direction, uh, the amount of detail you provided has been great, but good to probably restate it at the time a, a motion is made. Making me work hard. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Okay, Mr. Lay. Yeah, um, I'd just like to add for the, the duties description of the ED, um, if possible, I'd like it to also reflect that the ED uh, should have an intersectional lens on privacy and just really understanding, you know, how the privacy affects different populations. Thank you for that. Um, I meant to mention that when I was introducing them. Um, I thought of that as something that would be within the qualifications, but it could go either place. Um, and um, I would certainly be happy to, to add that. Thank you. I would now like to ask for public comment. Is there a public comment? Thank you, Chairperson. As a reminder to anyone who'd like to make a public comment, uh, please press the raise hand icon on your screen, or if you're connected by telephone, you can press star nine. Looks like we do have one comment from uh, Becca Kramer Mauder. Uh, Ms. Mauder, you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Becca Kramer Mauder, and I am calling on behalf of ACLU California Action, um, actually to encourage the board to look for someone who's not only strong in consumer privacy itself, but also brings that equity lens to their analysis of privacy issues. Privacy and technology, as you all know, are not neutral and impact different communities differently. For example, pay for privacy schemes impact lower income Californians in a different way than they impact wealthier Californians. While the racial and gender biases of face surveillance technologies harm certain people more than others. Thus, it's important to understand privacy issues through an equity lens to fully understand the issue. We therefore strongly encourage the board to ensure that staff leadership in the new organization be grounded in an equity approach to privacy matters. Thank you. Thank you for Thank your you. comment. So I apologize, Mr. Joseph Benero. This is one of those little glitches that I warned everybody about since this is our first meeting. Thank you, Ms. Kramer Mauder, for your comments. Does the board have any further comments? Um, is the board comfortable with adding an intersectional equity um, lens to the to the job description, Mr. Thompson? Uh, to your second question, yes, comfortable adding that lens. Um, I don't know if you wanted input on the qualifications now or in a at a separate time. Um, you know, I think you captured some of them, you know, ex experience, operational experience with a, you know, mid-sized organization, preferably governmental, uh, people management and leadership, a proven record of people management and, and leadership capability, ability, you know, a track record of driving for results in an operational context, um, being inclusive and collaborative um, with stakeholders, you know, uh, as has been pointed out, you know, there's going to be a lot of interest in the work of this agency and, and the person needs to really have, have shown some a, a predilection towards and experience with outreach and, and collaboration with interested stakeholders. So I think all of those things are, are, are going to be important traits in, and qualifications. Um, one minor mod uh, I don't know if it's minor one modification to your summary um, you know I, I remain concerned about the timing and you know I don't know what the pool of people we could get it on an interim basis to provide leadership are if there's recent retirees from other agencies or because um, you know I, I I'd be interested in Ms Garcia's perspective on timing minimum timing or, or Mr. Laird or anybody else appropriate. Um, to to hire somebody, um, but I'm I'm concerned if we if we're able to bring resources in, we may be asking too much of you, chairperson. Uh, I in in the absence of a senior leader, 
it seems like you're going to be the senior leader and you're going to be providing direction to these folks. Um, and I don't know if that's a reasonable expectation of you. Um, so I, I would like to find a way that we can have a senior staff person in place to provide some leadership um, while we make while we do this search. Um, presuming my, my my mental time frame is correct, that it, we're looking at three to four months before this person is is on board. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I do apologize. I dropped that thread slightly when I was doing my last summary. I recognize that I did now. Um, yes, my understanding of the way that this has generally happened, which again, isn't that common because generally there is an agency under the board and there's usually already an executive officer in place, um, is that the chairperson sort of functions in that role and simply has quite a lot of work for a little while. Um, there is the question of whether the board is okay with that. I am also happy to explore um, uh, the potential for an interim person. I took um, advice when I was asking, uh, when I was finding out options about this. Um, I was persuaded that having to train somebody and having to bring them up to speed um, was also um, very time consuming and may end up not ultimately um, being the most sort of efficient option. Um, but I would also be happy to look into that more if that is something the board would like and if Ms. Garcia thinks that it is a possibility for which I will, I will ask Ms. Garcia's advice. Thank you. Yes, obviously happy to explore any options of the board, but again, just to reiterate what Chairperson Urban said, given the learning curve and expertise and the timelines just to get staff loaned or doing a limited term position, for example, I do think it makes the most sense to just invest your time and resources in hiring the executive director as um, quickly as possible. And just to point out that timeline, for example, we do still need to send the request to CalHR to actually establish the classification. So while it's in statute, nothing exists in any governmental system at this point. So that would take approximately two weeks. Uh, an average posting is 10 days. Just to go back to um, board member Sierra's comments um, as well, you can do an until filled posting, but average is 10 days. Again, if you don't get the candidates, you can always extend if you start, want to start out with that um, initial time frame. And then so I would say at the earliest, we're looking at end of June to start reviewing uh, applications. Or sorry, end of July, I apologize. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, did you have further further thoughts? Um, no, so it sounds like a three to four month time frame for a person to be on board is is roughly correct. Is that okay? Um, yeah, and I don't, you know, as far as the learning curve, I feel like the people that have been helping us thus far have been teaching us rather than the other way around. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the learning curve is, is mutual, um, but. Uh, if others are, are uninterested in, in pursuing an interim person to relieve some of the pressure on both the chair and, and the staff hiring timing process, then I, I, I'm comfortable with that. It's my preference, but um, I, it may just be my preference. I'd like to pause in case other members of the board want to weigh in on that. Uh, Mr. Lake. Yeah, I, I just say, you know, I, I like, I understand that getting someone up to speed, um, and maybe this isn't the right time for this, but uh, I could see that in the interim, you know, staff, uh, our, our staff on loan can kind of get the ball rolling on the public engagement piece on all of the mandatory regulations that we have to do. Um, but I can, I can save that for future items if this isn't the right time to talk about that. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. Delatore? Uh, I have a question. I was wondering because I like uh, Mr. Thompson. I'm concerned about the the weight of just requirements and, and extra time that we might place on uh, chairperson Urban, not only on this item in the agenda, but in future items on the agenda. Um, is there will it be possible for some of these items to be delegated to a different member of the board? Um, it just occurs to me, particularly for this piece of hiring, that perhaps uh, Mr. Thompson has a lot of, um, you know, expertise that could be useful, but I'm just not sure if that is possible. Do we know, Mrs. Urban? 
So the statute, the, by statute, the board can delegate authority to me and to the executive director. I believe I can delegate some things, um, but I am going to have to um, ask Mr. Laird about that. I suppose it would depend on the um, nature of the delegation we're talking about specifically. Um, as, um, as I know uh, the chair is aware, um, there is this subcommittee structure, for instance, that ends up getting used a lot to, to do a lot of um, uh, uh, some of these functions. And uh, I think some of what we're discussing might even be considered still advisory. For instance, um, there could be a subcommittee tasked with kicking off um, rulemaking uh, um, uh, uh, engagement, for instance, or, or, or something like that, where then that, that would be their task, um, but really they're just doing information gathering and what that would culminate to would then be a set of recommendations to the board to actually consider an open meeting. And so I'm getting ahead a little ahead, I know of, of the subcommittee presentation, but I guess my point being, um, you know, for instance, subcommittee structures or individual uh, items that maybe don't culminate in an actual action of the agency. Um, I, you know, I think there's some more leeway as, as the chair suggested, um, but I think it depends on what specifically we're thinking of right now um, on, so, on, on what functions we're looking to fulfill. I think in this case, we'll be basically a subcommittee to provide advice on what will be the best structure for the agency so that perhaps we can identify somebody to assist uh, Ms. Irvin or somebody other than Ms. Irvin to basically take all of the all of the tasks. Will that be within the within the realm of what a subcommittee will be able to kind of assess and, and present? We will need to talk about subcommittees under the appropriate agenda item. But as I understand it legally, so long as the subcommittee is in an advisory capacity, I couldn't delegate authority to, you couldn't delegate authority to the subcommittee, I couldn't delegate authority to a subcommittee to act, but um, a subcommittee could act in advisory capacity, which it sounds like you are describing. That is my understanding. And Mr. Laird is, is nodding. Yes, that's correct. So again, bringing it back to this discussion, for instance, if there was some function of the hiring component short of actual hiring, uh, for instance, if you wanted to establish a subcommittee to evaluate a sp specific, uh, um, uh, position or, or something and then bring it back to the board you could again uh, whether or not the functions speed things up uh, or, or make things more efficient or take certain burdens off uh, the chair um, I will leave for you all to determine but um, there there are yes back to what I initially said as long as it's not actually taking an action of the agency um, and it's just to help sort of advice facilitate sort of advisory processes um, that that can occur um, sort of through any structure uh, you all wish to adopt. And uh, last question to make sure I understand. Um, the CPRA states that the board can delegate on the chairperson or the director, but it doesn't establish a prohibition to delegate beyond that. It's just that's the only reference in the law. Am I correct to understand that given that language under California administrative law, the board cannot delegate on anybody else other than the director or the chair. Is that a correct understanding of the law or is that not a correct understanding of the law? It's a good question. And I think you identified correctly that uh, we really only have that one section of the law that's explicit on the topic. Um, to be frank, I would wanna take the time to do a little bit more research to give you a, a fuller complete opinion on um, what the proper interpretation of that would be. but. Um, uh, we, we, we do know the part we do have, right? We know that there's certain functions we certainly can delegate to the chair without, uh, without reservation. And I, I don't think that that's necessary immediately, but that might be worth um, doing the research and understanding for future reference for the board. If we could perhaps add it to the items um, of the you know, things to do for the next meeting, Let's get that report on that, that would be helpful, thank you. I think that we, I thank you, Ms. Delatroy. I, this I think is a really good question and I agree. I think we will need to um, be sure that we cover this in our next agenda item, which is about delegations of authority. I just wanna be sure that we discuss 
um, everything under the appropriate agenda item so the public can come in and out if they would like. Um, so just putting a pin in that so that we can discuss it um, next time. I'll also say I'm about to go on sabbatical. <laughs> I'm taking sabbatical for this purpose because I took a look and I realized, uh, I'm not sure I realized fully, but I realized um, that this was going to be a big job. So um, please, um, I, I really appreciate all of the board members sort of attention um, to this and um, and all of your time as well, because we are all, all volunteers. Um, so, but I, I am I am committed um, to doing what is required um, to help us get off the ground. Um, with that, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Laird, I have one other procedural question I need to ask you, which is we've now had a little bit further conversation. Um, should we uh, request uh, public comments again, or should we move to um, our action item? Um, nothing prohibiting you from uh, giving another opportunity, obviously, to the public comment, but I, I think at this point we have had opportunity for the public to comment during this agenda item, so if you wish to move forward um, with a motion, that's perfectly acceptable. Thank you. I do not see anyone you know, in the public queue with their hands up, so um, I, will, I feel comfortable um, moving forward with the action item. I'm going to try to formulate this. Um, we can amend it, um, but I'm going to try to formulate this um, as a motion, or as a, I'm going to ask for a motion. Um, and, and I will try to formulate this in such a way um, that someone can just say, I so move. Um, so we'll see um, how well I can summarize this. The board agrees to adopt the following components of a hiring plan. First, the board delegates to the uh, chairperson of the board the ability to modify the duty statement that was in the materials today and to create a job description that includes the required components discussed by the board in this meeting and to follow required CalHR processes to get that position posted. When the position is posted, if there is not an intervening board meeting, the chair is delegated to work with staff to review initial applications and to determine a pool of candidates for the board to consider in a public meeting in closed session for the board to interview candidates and eventually to um, deliberate upon and choose a candidate for the position of executive director. The chairperson is further delegated to begin the process of um, uh, establishing and obtaining approval for two career executive assignments. Yes, Ms. Garcia? Assignments assignment, career executive assignment positions, the first being chief deputy director of administration described broadly in the duty statement in the materials for today with the modifications discussed in the meeting today. The second being a general counsel for the California Privacy Protection Agency. This will entail um, uh, paperwork required by CalHR, um, modifying the duty statement for the deputy director of administration, developing um, a job posting for the deputy director of administration, developing a duty statement for the general counsel, and developing a job posting for the general counsel. The chair is also requested to work with staff to um, discuss with the attorney general's office what the possibilities are for um, uh, temporary or loaned staff to assist the agency um, in, uh, in its work as it is being built. So moved. Oh. Is that it? Oh, I yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lay, for the motion. Thank you, Ms. Sierra, for seconding. Um, Mr. Uh, oh, sorry, Mr. Thompson? 
one quick thing is, do we want to limit the looking at loan staff to the attorney general's office in the motion? Looking, uh, working with staff to identify possible staff from other government agencies, primarily the attorney general's office. Oh, I did not intend to limit it in that way. Um, uh, Mr. Lay, maybe I misinterpreted. I it, no, it, it's possible I accidentally limited it that way. That was not my intent. Um, uh, Mr. Lay, um, if we amend the motion as Mr. Thompson has described, um, May I still, may I have a, a motion? Yes, I move uh, the amendment. And may I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, all right, um, Mr. Joseph Pinero, um, would you please do the roll call vote? Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Ms. De La Torre? I um, second that. Is that the right expression? I agree. <laughs> Uh, so Ms. De La Torre, I agree. Uh, Mr. Lay? Aye. Mr. Lay, aye. Ms. Sierra? Yes. Ms. Sierra, yes. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Thompson, aye. And Chairperson Urban? Aye. The motion has been approved by a vote of five yes to zero nay. Thank you very much, members of the board, for this really substantive and helpful discussion. I will take your direction um, and move forward um, with the hiring that we have discussed. I now propose that we do take a break. <laughs> um, everybody, okay, everybody is agreeing. Um, thank you all. Um, uh, let's go ahead and take, um, is 30 minutes enough or would people like 45? Um, I will 45 on my end would be helpful. 45. Ms. De La Torre? That's fine, 45 is fine. Okay. All right, um, so let's take a 45 minute break um, and uh, just round it off and return at 12.50 um, p.m. We will reconvene um, here and until then we are in recess, thank you. All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, of course, I immediately have a question for Mr. Laird. <laughs> Mr. Laird, um, to reconvene the meeting, do I need to do another roll call vote to, or excuse me, um, a roll call to establish the quorum or can we simply continue with the agenda? Apologies. Um, I think, uh, you know, to be on the safe side, maybe let's go ahead and do a roll call vote to reestablish quorum. Okay. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Mr. Joseph Pinero, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Thank you, Chairperson. So, Ms. De La Torre? Present. Mr. Lay? Present. Ms. Sierra? Present. Mr. Thompson? Present. And Chairperson Urban? Present. We have established a quorum. Um, so let us um, continue with the agenda. We are now reconvened. Let us continue with the agenda. We are now on agenda item number seven, discussion of a limited delegation of authority to the chairperson um, to allow me to fulfill some of the duties that we've been discussing under the last couple of agenda items. So this follows, I think, nicely from the rest of our discussion. I will introduce uh, the um, uh, idea behind the delegation of authority briefly, um, and then I will actually share my screen so that we can all look at the delegate draft delegation of authority together and discuss it um, before we take any action. Um, so in order for the um, agency to operate, uh, it needs there needs to be authority to uh, sign contracts, um, make various decisions. Um, we've been talking about hiring um, and that kind of thing in order to sort of oper operationalize the agency while we work on hiring the executive director um, and other staff. One easy example that Deputy Secretary Garcia mentioned um, is um, being able to contract um, with an existing agency for IT services um, so that we can have a website and we could notice this meeting. Um, but there are a number of things that, um, that need to happen behind the scenes. Uh, section 1798.199.35 of the CPRA, the CCPA, states that the agency board may delegate authority to the chairperson or the executive director to act in the name of the agency between meetings of the agency, except with respect to resolution of enforcement actions and rulemaking authority, end quote. So um, we must vote in order to um, exercise our power of enforcement and rulemaking, um, but otherwise authority can be delegated. I am now going to share the brief delegation of authority um, that council helped draft. Um, I will read through it um, and explain some of the particulars um, and then we can discuss it. One moment while I share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes? Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. All right. Um, so this is a very um, simple delegation of authority. Um, and um, uh, we, can, we can talk about the idea behind it and then um, any changes we might like to make um, in the meeting. Pursuant to Civil Code Section 1798.199.35, the California Privacy Protection Agency, CPPA, board or board, delegates to the board chairperson, Jennifer M. Urban, the authority to act on the board's behalf between meetings to the extent necessary for the efficient creation and day-to-day -day administration of the CPPA. This delegation includes the authority to act on the board's behalf between meetings to conduct and oversee the hiring of CPPA staff, except that this delegation shall not authorize the chair to hire for the executive director or chief privacy auditor positions without final approval by the board. This delegation shall expire one year from the date of approval unless otherwise rescinded or extended by the board. All right, so. Um, the idea behind this is basically um, for me to be able to operate, as we have been discussing, to reach out um, to set into place various administrative um, uh, uh, operations that need to happen right away. Um, my hope is that there wouldn't really be much need for the hiring delegation. Um, because the hope is that we will have an executive director to whom we will delegate that authority. At the same time, as we have discussed, there is an urgent need for um, hopefully finding some temporary help for certain things, for example. 
I considered whether to include the deputy, the chief deputy director of administration here. Um, we absolutely, uh, as something that the board must vote on, um, we absolutely can add that. And based on our discussion um, under the last agenda item, I assumed that we would want to. I was simply trying to sort of suss out again, like how much the board would want to be involved in some of these decisions. Um, because of the sort of variety of, um, of items that need to happen in order for the agency to be set up, um, this is fairly basic and general. Um, we can limit it in a variety of ways. So for example, it currently expires a year from now. We can change the expiration date. Um, we could renew it at every board meeting, for example, um, giving uh, the board the opportunity um, to hear from me and then decide sort of where the board would like to go from there. So there are a variety of options that we um, could, um, could use uh, with this delegation of authority. Um, I would also like to ask if Mr. Laird has anything to add on this. Um, my understanding is that we do have to have a formal delegation of authority um, in order to operate, um, but if there's anything else that he would like to add, um, I would invite him to do that now. Um, no, thank you to the chair. Um, I, I don't think I have much more to add at this point. Um, you know, it's always a little bit funny with the way sort of a board structure works, right? Because you have a board that only meets at intervals and then you typically would have an, a full staff who continues to do their day-to-day -day work, you know, sort of ongoing between meetings, allowing the board to, do, to uh, kind of only uh, touch on sort of the high level major issues touching the agency while, while other work happened. Um, we are in that position right now where staff doesn't um, really exist that much or there, <laughs> there is not a staff currently. And so um, I think uh, the view from, from our standpoint has just been that um, uh, we just wanna make sure there's clear authority for somebody to be acting on part of behalf of the agency um, for some of these administrative fat, uh, acts, especially um, to make sure there's not a question of, 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 of that authority as certain um, sort of preliminary uh, administrative steps are taken. So with that, uh, if there are questions, I'm sure between the chair and I, we can hopefully answer them. But uh, um, yes, this is this is very much aligned with, I think, what we see with other boards throughout the state as well. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Um, let's open it up to discussion. Uh, questions or comments from board members? Ms. De La Torre. Oh, thank you. Um, so a couple of questions. <clears throat> the first one is, how will the board be informed of the decisions that are made in between meetings? Will the chair report to the board during the board meetings and inform the board of the decisions that have been made? Well, what's the process for that? I would ask Mr. Laird to respond if there is a there's a legal process. Um, my thinking and my understanding would be that yes, the chair would report back on activities at every board meeting, and or um, others would report um, uh, if they were the right person. For example, uh, Ms. Garcia reported on some of the administrative activities that she's been overseeing, um, but the idea would be that the board would be informed of of whatever is happening to build the agency. Um, I suppose there is the question of, you know, if we buy some pens, um, is that something the board would, is that the level of detail the board would want? So we could also discuss um, sort of general parameters for the level of detail that the board would want. That is my understanding. Um, and I would ask if Mr. Laird had anything to add. Um, I, no, that that's all correct. And I, I guess I would add, um, the appropriate forum would be at these full board meetings. Um, there really wouldn't be a great opportunity in compliance with Bagley Keene um, or method for, for the chair really to report on the activities. Although, uh, of course, we can do things like have done uh, prior to this meeting where, you know, materials or reports are prepared in advance that, you know, we can be providing to you uh, leading up to the board meeting. Um, but the opportunities for sort of um, discussion, reporting, check-in, that sort of nature would have to happen to occur in open session. Thank you. My second question is regarding the 
time for this delegation. It seems to me that once the executive director is onboarded, there's not that much need for a delegation. Perhaps that will be the, the way to deal with the duration of the delegation instead of setting a specific time or each time we meet, we have to renew it, just set it up so that once we have onboarded uh, executive director that can take, off all of, take care of all of those um, day-to-day needs, um, maybe that's the time where this delegation of authority can, can basically elapse. So with, with that understanding that there's some form of reporting and, and Mrs. Um, Chairman, absolutely we don't need to know about pencils, but you know, some form of, of, of reporting of, of the activities and then maybe set the timing for um, for it to elapse once we onboard the executive director, from my perspective, this makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yes, I had the idea of having a trigger with the executive director. Um, I received advice it was a little complicated, but we can ask um, we can ask um, Mr. Laird about that um, again as we continue to discuss. Um, Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Perhaps one way to address the comment that uh, Ms. Delatory made was to have some limitation on the duration or cost associated with exercises of the authority or either and or um, only exercises of authority over a certain cost or over a certain duration would get shared with the board so that we don't get the pencil situation, but if we're if multi-year contracts are being entered into or above a certain spend threshold, um, that those would be either brought to the boards reported on or there'd be a limitation in the delegation. Those, those are just two ideas for how to how to deal with that. You know, I'm fine with you utilizing this authority. I think you, you have good judgment and you understand where kind of most of the rest of us are. So reporting on above a certain threshold or duration would be fine with me. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, I so I I'm sure as you have as well. I've certainly seen uh, monetary thresholds uh, in delegations of authority. That makes some sense to me. Um, uh, the time duration, whatever we decide to do, um, is also fine with me. Um, Mr. Laird, uh, what is the possibility? Do you think of building some of these things into the language? Um, a monetary duration. Uh, uh, maybe a reporting requirement? Should we do it as provided that, um, the, unless the board is comfortable with it being a little bit less formal than that um, and the time duration? Yeah, so I would say you have absolute flexibility to kind of carve out the parameters as the board sees fit here. Um, I agree that uh, a trigger um, for when the executive director comes on board makes sense. I suppose the only thing though is then I would recommend if, if we really want the exact same delegation to transfer at that time, um, you know, this, uh, this delegation that's, that would be voted on should include that that delegation shall automatically transfer to the executive director at that time. Um, but again, you know, as we all learn more, um, to be frank, I wouldn't be surprised if you revisit this at the time the executive director comes on regardless, um, just as you have a better understanding of maybe what functions are needing to be uh, delegated still or unclear, for instance. Um, so uh, however you, you, you want to cut it, though, it, uh, it is, is fine. Um, clarity is just always the, the best component for these things. Same with the monetary threshold, I should mention, too, that um, that is perfectly fine. And I've seen that in plenty of delegations as well. Thank, thank you, Mr. Laird. Uh, Mr. Thompson, did you still have your hand up before I... Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Sierra. Um, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I do, I like the fact that this gives you lots of flexibility because I think given there's so many items to address that that is really helpful to have the flexibility. So I'm com I'm very comfortable with this. And I just, and I do, um, Mr. Laird pointed out, like we are probably gonna want, I, I agree, we're gonna probably wanna revisit this once we know, you know, we have selected an executive director, you know, and this builds in this language that, you know, we have, you have the one year unless otherwise rescinded or extended by the board. So we always have 
you know, that opportunity as things develop and we may want to add something or change something that we could at any board meeting do that. So I think that's, yeah, I would, I would prefer to just assume we're going to be revisiting this at the time of the executive director is selected versus saying now all this gets transferred to the executive director. And, um, you know, whether or not we put in the limitation or the amount for reporting or the reporting is implied, because again, the board can request that at the meetings, um, I'm happy either way. So I, I tend to prefer um, it being as, as flexible as possible though. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. I did have, oh, sorry, Ms. De La Torre. I, I just wanted to add, I think that Mrs. Uh, Sierra brought up a really good uh, point here that maybe just leaving it as is and just setting it in the agenda of every meeting to revisit this for every meeting might be just the most functional way of doing it instead of trying to edit it um, uh, right now. And then with, you know, with the idea of, you know, some informal report that maybe we don't need to be you know, in going detail right now about the thresholds that we might want to include, but maybe um, Mrs. Urban for the next meeting can, you know, come up with some some general parameters on what is worth all of us kind of being aware of. Um, and then just, you know, for every meeting we, we revisit it. And uh, once the executive director is appointed, we can create a new one for the executive director or decide to transfer this one to the executive director. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I, shall I go ahead though and add the Chief Deputy Director of Administration to the list? All right, if everyone will bear with me, I'm going to actually type as we, as we sit here. Um, Okay. Um, thank you. And then let's return to the question of thresholds. Uh, Mr. Thompson, do you want to try to put in a monetary threshold now or are you, um, are you satisfied with um, asking me to figure out a good threshold and bring that to the next board meeting? My suggestion was just a threshold that you would then tell us how you use the, like I'm making this up. If it's more than a year contract or over a hundred over five hundred thousand dollars you would let us know that you use the authority um i'm also comfortable with you determining you know what you think is is you know i don't know how many things would exceed that so maybe it's two maybe it's zero or i'm also comfortable with with your discretion on determining um what needs to be reported to the board thank either you. way is fine with me thank you mr thompson Ms. Delatore? I was going to ask um, to the point on thresholds where we set up the agency, I think is a big question that we have to address sooner rather than later, because it's going to be also effectively important for those applying for roles, you know, whether this is going to be, I mean, I'm just using example, Sacramento or San Diego. Or, so, um, were you envisioning selecting the location of the agency as something that will be within this authorization or were you envisioning that as something to be discussed by the board? Um, I was just wondering. Thank you. I'm really glad that you brought that up because that is, I will, I will address your direct point in just a moment, Ms. De La Torre, but it also applies to uh, Mr. Thompson's point about a monetary threshold is that my one worry is that if I need to sign um, something uh, for the real estate fund that Ms. Garcia mentioned, um, we may, we, if we try to put in a threshold now, that we may end up with a threshold that's kind of meaningless for day to day um, because it's, it's about, she said about $4 million, um, but it's really a one-time, it's just a one-time um, one time expenditure. And then with regards to choosing a physical location for the agency, um, my plan, um, and again, we need to um, be sure that we remain within our agenda items, um, but my plan would be um, to either have me develop some options for the board to consider um, at, um, this, at our next meeting or when, whatever meeting is appropriate and or to have a subcommittee 
And part of their job is to advise the board on that. So that is, that, that is my thinking. Um, and um, I would be happy to, to hear, um, hear the, board's, the board's thoughts on that. I think, I, think that, I think that it is relevant to the delegation of authority, of course, is the reason that you, you brought it up, Ms. De La Torre. So I think that we could talk about that here. Ms. Sierra? Yes, I am really glad that um, Ms. De La Torre brought that up as well, because I was thinking it also is relevant for our posting for our chief or executive director yeah. at this point. I mean, that's going to be very important unless the idea is that it's going to be multi-city possibility. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Laird, how much can we talk about this agenda, have this item? Do we need to note, put it on another agenda or? Um, I, I think, um, I mean, I think to the extent we, we need to explore some of this to understand any ways we want to uh, limit or expand your delegation, I think it's uh, acceptable to be discussing at this time. Okay. Um, but with that said, um, obviously, if we start focusing too much and making decisions about um, things outside of the delegation, um, then we should uh, properly agendize. I think that um, the way I would look at exercising this delegation for this particular um, function would be um, to, to work with staff to come up with um, options, which would include um, both, you know, maybe both um, something that is based in Sacramento, also multi-city and or remote options, um, particularly given our current situation. And uh, when the board next meets um, to um, talk that through and find out what the board thinks is most appropriate, um, we would need to be sure that we talk about